there. There we go. Deep, you ready? So Deep is going to be on the call for about 30 minutes, guys. So what I want to do is I want to break it up into two parts. I want to talk um, primarily on inspections first, and then we're going to, on the second half, we're going to talk about appraisals. Um, and again, we're going to go through, answer any questions that you may have pertaining to inspections and appraisals. So I'm excited, guys. Um, so guys, again, my name is Liz. I'm here in the central Orlando as well, excuse me, I'm more so Port Polk County. Deep will argue that no one knows where that is, but here we are. Um, so I just wanted to talk like a little bit. Me. Oh God, don't start with me. <laughs> I love you. Um, so I kind of wanted to talk about inspections and the importance of inspections for your clients, guys. Um, and I'm going to give you some tidbits of do's and don'ts, like, you know, how to properly, you know, like let's address an, uh, let's address that inspection, but not being an inspector, but also on the real estate side, what to do to protect yourself when you're going through the inspection period, because literally I'm dealing with something right now from the other side, and I never want this to happen to you guys. So this is perfect timing. Um, Deep, do you have anything that you want to put out there and before we get started? Uh, uh, guys, first of all, we've been talking about this for four months. The so market is shifting. So if any listing agent tells you that you have to buy the property as is, those days are gone. So keep that in mind. You know, I know new agents who's been in the business the last two years. Uh, those were the terms before. When you go to the regular real estate market, when the regular people sell real estate, you can negotiate every aspect of the inspection. You can negotiate every aspect of your appraisal. Uh, the seller does not have to agree, and uh, but still, there's a room that you could you know uh, work around. So that keep that in mind. I know a lot of people learn what's uh, uh, happening, uh, what happened in the last two years, but now we are back to the basics. We're negotiating. I'm negotiating things even before going under contract. You know, Roofs. So, yes. ACs, guys. Yes. I, I think right. At, my last deal we put together, uh, the roof is 17 years old. We're gonna. I know we're gonna have an issue uh, because the insurance companies are having a lot of issues in Florida. We have very limited insurance companies in Florida, uh, 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 insuring properties. And I started negotiating beforehand. The seller was pissed off, but you know I'm doing my due diligence before, and the buyers, uh, the seller's agent has not done that. You know, they had no clue when the roof was purchased. It was a, they bought it as a foreclosure and they have no idea. I'm like, hey, this is going to be an issue in two weeks after I spend $600 on an inspection. Why go there now? Let's talk about it now. And I wanted to see how, what they're going to play with or are they even going to be easy to work with? And it looks like they are. So we are on the contract. Yeah. We'll start with that and I'll let you lead the call, Liz, and I'll jump in as we go. Okay, so one of the things that I want to talk about, guys, is um, prior to you going to show any property, I think it's the most important thing to review the seller's disclosure, guys. Review, you know, when you're going through and you're looking at your broker synopsis and you see the, and you're look, reading the description, guys, read the description. Let's just throw that out there. Read the description because more than likely if it has a new roof, new windows, new water heater, new AC, they are going to put that on their description because those are highlights in order to bring more buyers to the property and to get more attraction. So please, 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 I don't know how much I'm going to stress this, read the dang description. Also, read your seller's disclosure, guys. Like if it doesn't tell you on the description how old the roof is, more than likely it will tell you on the seller's disclosure if there's one available. You can also go to the um, property appraiser's website. You can pull up permits that way, guys, especially I know for a fact in Orange County, you can go through if you are in the greater Orlando area, you go to Orange County property appraisers and there's a, you put in the address, there's a little section there that says search county um, um, search county permits. You can pull up and you can find out the last time they did a mechanical, um, a mechanical permit, a roofing permit, and those things. So, guys, please, please, please read your seller's disclosures and everything, so you know when you're taking your buyer. Like, if you know for a fact that you have to negotiate closing costs and things like that, and it's right at the top of that client's budget, you already know what you're going into. And if they don't have the money, just like, hey guys, like 
I, I know you love this house. I know this is everything. It checks off all the boxes. However, the uh, AC is original and so is the roof. Do you have 30, 000, you know, twenty thirty thousand dollars to negotiate? If not, we can definitely go through and we if it's priced correctly, because you should be doing CMAs before you go show any property to make sure it's priced correctly or to find out if it's undervalued or over, you know, or over or overpriced. You want to make sure that you go through and you have those conversations before you're setting any appointment with your buyers to make sure if it's even a candidate for them. Because if they have to go in automatically, do a whole kitchen renovation, then you find out that the roof is 20 years old. It's not going to be able to get in short, especially in Florida. They're kind of stopping it at 15 years, guys. If you have a 15-year-old roof or older, we can't find insurance. We can't find insurance for it. So make sure you have those conversations. That that's something if you guys are in Florida, so you know, 15 years, it will pose a problem. So these, these listing agents, us as listing agents, we should be having the conversations before we're taking the listing to say, hey, let's price this correctly with the adjustment of the roof, or let's price it right as is knowing that this may pose us a problem that we may have to put a roof on. So that's kind of where I wanted to get started with that. Um, do, do you have anything to add into that? Yeah, um, exactly what kind of she's, uh, going back to exactly what she said, there's going to be listing agents who's, who's going to say, oh, yeah, you can get finance, uh, you can get insurance for it. And that happens all the time because I, mm -hmm. that was the same scenario I was going with. But you could get insurance, but it would be much higher than what you normally pay. So yeah. that could affect your buyer's debt ratio. And now he might not get finance for that. So yeah. keep that in mind. It's very crucial. Every aspect of the deal is going to be changing now going forward. And wow. especially with inventory growing every day, your buyers have better options. They, you know, uh, you know, check, look at their checklist, look at their what the whys are, look at every aspect of the business. It's really going to make it easier for you in the long run when you do your due diligence ahead of the time, ahead of getting to the property, try to get as much basic knowledge. Nobody's telling you to be an expert at each listing that you're going to be showing, uh, but have some kind of ballpark information. More yeah. educated you are, more comfortable your buyer is going to be, and more, uh, more secure they're going to feel towards you. So it depends on, so I, there are two questions in the chat and two comments, excuse me. So somebody asked about townhouses. So I just want to bring that up with townhouses and condos, guys, uh, condos are typically done by the community, a townhouse. It depends. Is it going to be the seller's responsible or is it going to be the HOA's responsibility? So typically like once it gets, if you're, if the HOA is going to cover it, they will typically be a little more on point or you will know like per the seller's disclosure the last time it was replaced. Um, and then guys, this is typically for um, what I was talking about the 15 years, that's typically for architectural shingle. Um, you still have metal roofs that are, that take, you know, that have a longer lifespan and tile roofs do have a longer lifespan. So just keep that in mind. 15 years is just for architectural shingle. I do apologize. I didn't put that out there. Liz, um, uh, on the on the question somebody asked about the townhomes, there's two two things to remember. Whenever you mm -hmm. find a townhomes, please call the association. Yes. Some towns home covered the whole roof. The repairs are done by the owners. Yep. The replacement is done by the association. Correct. You always double check. Yep. Go ahead, Claire. Clear. So Liz, I like what you talked about, about the shingled roofs. So just be mindful when you're asking your owners as well, what type of architectural shingle, okay? Mm -hmm. Architectural shingles can be 30, 40, 50, or 60 year. Yeah. However, a three tab roof in Florida is 25 years. However, they don't last 25 years in Florida. So the three tabs are the ones that are most critical. The architectural shingle, you need to ask the owners what type of architectural shingle and do you have a warranty so that you can find out what years they are. These are all great questions that we ask prior to. So Liz, thanks for sharing all this with us. Yeah, guys, like this is important, especially now where we are in a shifted market and you can negotiate repairs. Guys, um, the next thing I want to stress um, and it's just kind of 
guys, learn how to write up your repair addendums. You need to cover your A, like learn how to write up your repair addendums. I know a bunch of agents who've been in the business for the past two years and never had to do one. Um, this is the time to learn. You can go to classes like me personally. Claire knows she is like my Google. I call her all the time and I say, mom, I need to write up an, I need to write up a repair addendum. This is what I wrote up. Does this cover my ASS? And she looks at me and she'll read it. She goes, uh-uh, fix this, check this. Guys, don't feel like, don't feel bad for reaching out to someone else to go through and, re and to review your repair addendum. Because at the end of the day, if you have, hey, um, you know, a handyman, handyman to fix a plumbing issue, but it's actually something that has to be pulled by, like has to have a, a contractor do it to be able to pull the permit in order to, you know, a mechanical permit to pull out an AC and you're saying plumber, like you just bit yourself in the butt. I mean, I don't think anyone would make that big of a mistake, but that's something that you want to do. Or if there's a roof that needs to be replaced, like those have, those are permits. So you need to make sure that you're covering your tushy when you're saying, I'm going to pull, you know, you're going to pull a permit and have it closed out by final inspection or final walkthrough or whatever the case is, guys. You want to make sure that you protect yourself and give yourself enough time during these inspection periods, right? Because I see um, Holly is talking about septic and well testing. So remember, guys, like when you're going through, like during your inspection period, um, you know, during the, the past two years, we were doing crazy things in Florida where we were doing two day, three day, five day inspection periods. And you're running into a home that has not only you need a full home inspection, you need a well inspection and a septic inspection. And you have to try to get all of that done in one day, you know, or in a matter of three days. And it was just crazy booked out guys, give yourself, you know, 10, 15 days to be able to get the people in there so that you can get your inspections done so that you have time for negotiations. Um, always hire a licensed specialist um, or contractor. Um, 100%, Bob, thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, guys, this is crucial. Um, this is absolutely crucial. I'm going to tell you, side note, guys, I have a listing right now on a condo. Listen to this. Mother is the agent. Daughter is, you know, they are buying the property together. Mom is a, a broker, guys, a broker. <laughs> Her daughter has been the one communicating with me. Um, we had a seven-day inspection. Day seven is the home inspection. Day seven. For me, if you know that you have a seven-day inspection and your inspection is going to be on the last day, I'm already preparing an extension for the inspection period because guess what? They put a $5,000 escrow on this property. It's a $150,000 listing. They put five grand down. Listen to this. Friday, Thursday is the end of our inspection period. Five o'clock. I, I like to use the word five o'clock. Most people will argue uh, midnight of the business day, I like to use five o'clock, here's why, and I'll go into this in a second. I wanna know before the end of the inspection period by 5 p.m. on that business day, hey, are we moving forward or not? If they choose not to do any of the things that we are asking for, are you prepared to move forward with this property? And if their answer is yes, I know that we're good to go. You know, I'm sending over, I'm still requesting whatever repairs we need to get done. However, I wanna make sure that they're gonna, you know, that hey, we're moving forward, but between my client and I, here's the, what I don't want you to do. Last day of the inspection period, they don't get their report back until Saturday. No extension was, no extension was done. Saturday, the daughter texts me and says, hey, we want this done. No offense. I completely ignored it. You want to know why? Because one, it wasn't requested to me on a repair addendum. And two, the time for negotiations ended on Thursday. Just saying. So then the mom had the audacity to text me and she is a licensed broker. Mind you, the person who's communicating with me is not the agent. It is the daughter. She is just the client. The mother texts me who was like, hey, uh, you need to fix this. Texts it to me. You need to fix this. And, and I'm like, um, she's like, well, I told my daughter to ask you. I said, yes, as a licensed professional, this should have been presented to me on a repair addendum. And the, and the time for negotiations ended on Thursday at five o'clock, which now if you guys decide to pull out that $5,000 belongs to my seller. It was a simple, it was a simple thing. I'll probably get my buyer, my seller to fix it. Something really small, but she's not obligated to do so. 
Are you willing to lose your clients $5,000 for something simple because you didn't put, you didn't, you didn't hit your deadlines the way that you're supposed to. So I cannot stress this enough, know your dates. And if you know that you cannot get all of your inspections in during your time frame, guys, please, 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 I cannot stress this, extend your inspection period. Have the conversations with the listing agent. If you are on the buy side, hey, we might need a, a day or two extension. Is that going to be okay? X, Y, and Z. If they say no, prepare to write up releasing cancellation, guys. Because if you do not, you're jeopardizing your client's escrow. And it can be $1,000. It can be $20,000. Whatever they put down in that initial three days, that's what you like to do. Something that I do is when I have a buyer, if I'm asking for a seven-day inspection period, I try to get inspections done day one and day two. Because by the third day, they have to submit their escrow deposit. So before my people even wire money to title, I tell them, guys, let's get this inspection done so we know for a fact, 100% that you're going to move forward with this property so that we can go through and, and um, send escrow. That makes my life so much easier because I don't have to worry about someone put, putting up four grand if they know for a fact that it needs a roof, an AC, a water heater, so much more that already popped up. Deep, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, there are a couple of agents on the call. Uh, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, they're not changing with the times. They're not changing with the market. They're being aggressive with uh, inspections, uh, five-day, three-day inspection. Forget that. Get that out of your head. You're not winning deals because of your inspection time frame. You're going to lose a deal. You're going to create bad relationships with the listing agent. Put as much time as you can. I've started going back to seven to 10 days. Let them come back and negotiate. Last one I put in, I put 10 days. They came back with eight. That's good enough compared to five days. So please, that gives you enough leverage that we are talking about. Enough leverage that if your buyer needs to talk to an AC company, electrician, or, or their you know, family friend who's an expert at uh, 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 inspection, because everybody's got one of those, uh, and we'll explain to them, oh, this is what's it, or scare them. And that's the time you step in. You have enough days to resolve this issue. You can discuss this upfront with the listing agent. And if they agree, great. And, and sometimes uh, they might not. So at the end of the day, more time you have, better it is when it comes to negotiation. And agents who have been in the business long enough hate when people come with five-day inspections to win offers. And on the fourth day, oh, I can't even get my inspector down there till seven day. Forget it. Next guy. I move to the next uh, next buyer. So okay. I know it sounds pretty rude and uh, stuck up, but that's what I am. And it's important, guys. Like, So we should all have our vendor partners that we work with. Um, so we are supposed to give our clients three different options, guys. Make sure you're doing that. You don't ever want to say, hey, use my inspector. You know, I'm going to talk about one of the guys that I work with. His name is Jimmy. Hey, guys, use Jimmy. He is the best. I promise you. And then all of a sudden, because you recommended him and Jimmy missed something big on an inspection that you get hit with the ball. Oh, you told me, Liz, that to use your inspector. So now they're coming back at me because they moved into the property and now, you know, he missed that the dishwasher wasn't working or whatever the case is. And I'm the one getting blamed for it because it was my inspector. So always guys, I cannot stress this enough, have at least three vendors in every category for ACs, for, for home inspections, for whatever painters, you name it and say, Hey, these are people that I've worked with in the past. My clients have worked with in the past. They've had great response. Here you go. You do who, you know, you have the conversations you have the, you know, you, do Hi, everything. Hey, do you have a question? Haley? Okay, sorry. Um, so you have the questions or whatever, so it doesn't come back on you guys. Um, and you let them know that this is, you know, they chose the person. Hey, um, I see you raise your hand, and then once you're done, I'll finish up.
you're on mute. Hagel, you're on mute. My bad. I accidentally raised it and now I was lowering it. You're doing awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so I can't stress that enough, guys. Um, so make sure that you're always handing out free referrals for your home inspectors. And for me as an agent, you know, I know we get busy and everything. The more you attend your home inspections, like if it's a vacant property or anything, and you cannot be at your home inspection, make sure the listing agent knows um, there is not anything that drives us more crazy than going into, a, you know, going under contract as a listing agent and you find out that the buyer's agent didn't attend a home inspection and didn't tell you. Or if it's owner occupied and the sellers are going to be there and your buyers want to be there, you damn sure better be at that home inspection. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> like there is no nice way to put that. Um, we are not home inspectors, so we cannot go through, you know, we try to understand it. I always say, hey guys, let's review this report with the home inspector. So if there's any questions that you have that I may not be able to answer, you can direct them strictly to the home inspector and we can talk about it, you know, on a three-way call, whatever the case is. However, I highly suggest that if you cannot be at a home inspection, you get somebody in there that is going to be a licensed professional to be there with that home inspector. But again, cannot stress this enough, if the seller is going to be there and your buyer is going to be there, I don't care what you have to do, you better be at that home inspection because they start negotiating and having conversations and everything without you there and God help, that could get very ugly very quickly. So um, that's what I have to say about that. Deep, is there anything that you want to input in? Uh, a couple of questions that was there uh, regarding septic, uh, septic uh, inspections. Yep, uh, I would recommend always to do one. Uh, if, if the seller can provide you a copy of the last inspection they did, it was done in the last six months, you can call the company and find out and double check they have that. Uh, but I would recommend that because that's a, a small fix. You know, people think it's a small cleanup job. It could be the motor. It could be something else. And the, the buyer needs to replace the whole set. I have a funny story about this too. <laughs> yeah, that could be a big issue for them. So it's always double check your listing, double check with the listing agent. 99% of the time, the listing agent has no idea it's on septic. So please double check on their aspect of it. So, and if you can, they can provide you and the buyer's okay with that. And and you can only, 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 only other thing I would say is just call them and double check it was done. You know, I know nobody's going to provide a false documentation, but it's possible in this, uh, in this, day, this day and age. But I'll, I always double check it on my end and I let the buyer do the same. So it's not so, comes down to me only. So something that I do, guys, like um, when I go into a property in this, again, I have all of the interesting stories. Real estate is never the same, guys. It's not a one size fits all. Um, I actually just closed on a deal that was on septic. Um, it had a well, but it was on public water, which was kind of cool, but here we are. Um, the owners, the previous owners owned the property for two years. Guess what guys? They never did a pump out because they didn't know where, they didn't even know where the septic tank was. So during my inspection period, we had to not only you know, we had to find the survey to locate the septic tank so that we can get up, we can get an inspection done. I always prepare my clients like, you know, hey, it's on septic, it's on well, you're going to have to pay for the inspections. I never want to put the work on someone else and say, hey, we're going to rely on this person to give us this report because as you see, they didn't even know where the damn thing was. Um, and it's unfortunate. I'm like, how have these people been living here for almost three years and don't know where the septic tank is? That's kind of nasty. But here we are. This is just what it is. So just prepare yourself for that, guys. I always, you know, when you're having your conversations with your clients in the initial, you know, in your initial buyer consultation, inspections should come up because you want to talk about budgeting for your inspections. If it's a, if it's a home, sorry, guys, my alarm went off. Um, if it's, I'm like, hey guys, if we find something for, you know, that's on public sewer, public water, you're probably going to have to budget about $600 for a home inspection, plus probably about another 500. If we find something that's on septic, that's going to be, you know, a, another 500. Um, and if it's FHA, you need to know that you, ne you need to get a four point and wind mitigation. So you need to make sure that you're budgeting for all of that. So have your conversations with your 
you know, with your vendor partners, your inspectors and stuff like that, say, hey, what are your, what are, what are the prices looking like now just to have a regular home inspection with a um, four point NA wind mitigation? Most inspectors will do it, you know, at a, at a bulk price and it'll be a lot cheaper instead of them going with three different home inspectors. So make sure you're having those conversations, guys. Stay in the know. Again, we're not licensed home inspectors. However, if you attend your inspections, you'll start to know like, oh, okay, this one isn't GFCI protected. However, I know um, it's a quick fix. You may need a, you may or may not need a licensed electrician to be able to change out this GFCI or to get it grounded, but you kind of have an idea of what it costs because your inspector is there sitting there telling your buyer. So you know it going forward or, hey, you know, this AC is 10 years old. It's at its lifespan, but it looks really, really good. And you have your AC partners are just like, oh, like a four, you know, a one and a half ton is he's going to charge this amount to be able to do it. So make sure you're staying in the know when it comes to your inspect to your inspections. Have the conversations with your inspectors. Guys, I can bring someone on one day to talk about inspections and why they're important as, you know, just stay in the know guys this, this is all to cover you because god forbid if something goes wrong the person that they're going to come to is you they're going to be angry with you because you didn't tell them so just please cover your butts guys deep anything to add no we're good um Honestly, like that's kind of all I really wanted to stress about inspections is just knowing your time frame, guys. Please, please, please do everything that you can to when you go under contract on something, put it on your calendar for two days before the end of your your inspection period to make sure that you've done everything, you've gotten all your reports back, you submitted your repair request so that you can cover not only your butt, but you protect your client's money. For me, I'm always like, I don't play with people's money. Like, that's not me. I will never jeopardize someone's money. You need to, you know, we need to make sure that we know if we're moving forward, whether they say they're going to do everything or if they're going to do nothing. That's always for me. So does anyone have any questions pertaining to inspections? Liz, I think there are a couple of questions regarding septic. Uh, if, yeah. It's part of your negotiation, guys. It's no different than any other negotiation that you do. So if you've got a septic issue that needs to be pumped and could cost you anywhere from $600 to $1,000, depends on how much shit's in there, right? <laughs> Literally. And, uh, so, and at the same time, when they do the inspection, they can mean a lot of times, a lot of these uh, septic companies are in money not to take the shit out. They want to replace the pumps and replace the tanks. And so they they're always going to make it worse for you. And say, oh yeah, this is uh, this is this is old. This is twenty year old. You might have to replace it. It might cost you anywhere from four to five thousand. And I've been in the situation. I went back and I submitted it because if you give yourself enough time, you can tackle this. If you do everything last minute, you're not going to be able to take tackle this. Yeah. You're not going to get what you need for your client. You are yeah. going to fall uh, short, and then that's the time you're going to be running around looking for extension. And and if they don't sign one. Uh, uh, your buyer is going to be unhappy. They are out of contract. Uh, they'll get their money back because you sent a cancellation before that. Uh, but now you got to go look for an, one more house. So please, please cannot emphasize when I'm working on a contract and I feel the energy that I'm working with Liz, that this deal is going to be uh, agreed by both parties. I'm already communicating with my buyer, with the inspection companies, getting the dates going. Uh, it's already in the ballpark. Like, you know, before I, the contract gets accepted, I sometimes email the listing agent, hey, we're doing an inspection on Monday, 10 o'clock. And they're like, what the hell? And, you know, just be prepared. You want to get more time so you can do more negotiation. And in this market, uh, please, you know, more you know, more negative that is, better for your buyer. Yep. Absolutely. Claire? So I appreciate both of y'all. And one of the things that I find most beneficial is if I have a first time home buyer, okay, or if I have a first time home seller, like they've never sold a home before, I remind them that the reports that come out today standard are between 75 and 100 pages. Because when they see that big, huge report, they're like overwhelmed. Oh my God, my house is terrible. Mm -hmm. And they can get a mindset 
of negativity already. If we're being the step down transformer and de-escalating that and preparing them ahead of time during our consultations with them, it goes much easier because all we need to focus on is not the house maintenance and education of the house. It's the defects of the house, which is literally one page long. Typically, you know, it's one page long. That's all we're looking at. You know, we don't need the education of the house. We need the defects. So these are things that Liz and Deep have both been touching on. And I find it so informational wise and so helpful is making sure that everybody is educated prior to the inspections for sure. So then that way nobody's caught off guard. Oh, my God, it's 80 pages long. We're walking away. Well, hang on. Instead of having to talk them off the ledge, if they're already prepared for that, then there's not as much of a ledge. So y'all, thank you. You're doing a great job. And that's something that I tell my clients to like, I'm like, the, the, the job of the home inspector is to find everything that can that is wrong and can be wrong with the property. For example, if we see a lot of people in Florida are not you know, they don't understand that we have cracks in our driveway, guys. I'm like, this is normal for Florida. However, if you were to see something like that up north, they're just like, oh my God, the foundation, what the hell? Like, you know, they freak out. So we have to educate our people in, you know, while we're at these, I'm like, hey, this is normal. As long as it's not, a, you know, as long as you can't stick a quarter in it, then we're good. You know, we have stucco. I don't know why Florida uses stucco. Like, that's just what it is. We should not use stucco out here, but that's how most of our homes are made um and i'm like you know this is i'm like hey if it's bigger than this then you know and the inspector will you know share that with them if, it, if you could stick a quarter in it you know that's a problem however sometimes you just need to sand it down fill it in paint over it and you're good so or hey i had this on a on an inspection report all the time it's missing a door stop it's missing a door stopper so I'm like, those are the things that are going to come up on your inspection reports. And the job is to find everything that can be wrong. However, we want to focus on the things that are most important to you. So for example, electrical, roofing age, AC, water heater, plumbing, does it have poly piping? We want to make sure that every, like the bones of the property are good. Or if there's little things like, hey, it needs smoke detectors. Hey, did you know that you could go down to the, um, to the fire station? Is it the fire station? I forget where it's at. That you can pick up free smoke detectors. So things like that, guys. Like, so if you sit down with your home inspectors, they'll tell you this. So I think that's kind of where I'm at with that. Does anyone have any questions about inspections? I think deep left. Did he leave me? No, I'm here. I'm on the phone now. So Liz, there's a, there's a question from Michelle that says, have Florida homeowner insurance companies ever declined coverage because of lack of septic service? Newbie question. Um, so typically when I am going into a home that has a septic inspection in order for, um, that has a septic tank, the the home, the insurance company requires that we have the septic inspection. So you have to present that to them. And if in the event that you have to present it to them and they're just like, hey, this won't suffice, we have to take that back. And it's just like, hey, I know that, you know, we presented it to the insurance company. They said this isn't going to suffice because X, Y, and Z, this needs to be done in order to move forward. You know, we, and because if we, if we can't buy an insurance, we don't have loan approval. Therefore, my buyer can't buy this house. So what are you willing to do? Does that make sense, guys? Tina? Hi, yes. Um, two questions, actually. The first one, as a listing agent, do you sometimes think that you might just pay for the inspection for the seller up front? No. Okay. And... Is there an inspection that is broad that will touch on septic a little bit so that if there's something deeper to go into? No. So you're going to have, those are going to be separate inspections. So you have your full home inspection, which you, and which you can include your four point and your wind mitigation. Most people like to get wind mitigation reports. Um, I believe FHA requires it, but you need a um, wind mitigation in order um, for FHA because it gives you a discount on your home insurance. So always make sure that your people get a, home, a wind mitigation report, guys. Just put that out there. <laughs> it gives you the discount. Um, and then your septic tank, that's a completely different inspector. 
So they need a whole separate licensing for septic inspection. So that's a, sec a separate inspection. Your well inspection, um, one of the uh, vendor partners that I work with, he also does well. So it makes it easier because he can do, if I'm on a septic, you know, if I'm on, if I need all three inspections, he can do, you know, three out of the five. I mean, four out of the five. So yeah. it, it works. So definitely have the conversations because you're going to need three home inspectors. May, some of them may not be able to do all. Also, guys, keep in mind for VA loans, you need a WDO. And most home inspectors who are licensed for regular home, ins uh, for home inspections cannot do WDOs. Sometimes they need to do, you need to do another inspection. And that right there, guys, for VA loans, and I do apologize that I can touch base on that. That's a wood destroying um, organism inspection that a VA will not approve a loan if you do not have that. So that needs to be done. So Liz, on that, um, I have someone who has a 1954 home. In Florida, I mean, the WDO, the, 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 there's so much. And I just in my head and being brand new, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I just want an inspection for myself to know all the junk that we're going to have to deal with. Being new, I'm like, OK, I can catch it up front and all that. But I do see the liability. You don't even want to attach yourself to that at all. Yeah. But I just want to somehow encourage them to maybe do one, the seller himself. I How would you... How do you do that, encourage that, and, and let them see that it only benefits them? Claire, I know you want to speak on this, so go right ahead, Mama. Okay, so Tina, this is, this is something that's good for us in the market that we're in right now, okay? Mm -hmm. Do not discount yourselves. This is where you show value because of your vendor partners. And Tina, you had asked, do you pay for it for them? No, however, if you know that you are in a situation where you're going to have a have to have a WDO inspection, you're going to have to have a home inspection, a well and well and septic inspection. Here's what I do for them: if they do not have the money to be able to do that, I am more than willing, at a higher listing amount, to be able to do it. And this is what I always say in my in my listing consultations. Okay. I list properties between six and 10%. Notice I said properties, not homes. Okay. Cause in the state of Florida, we can list vacant land for 10%. However, if they need help, then I will show them how it will benefit them and net more at a 7% listing or a seven and a half percent listing. And they don't have to put any money back. I will earn that money and get it back for myself. Note to self, this is where the rubber beats the road. If you're showing value, you never have a problem with that. And you're also helping them in de-escalating their stress that you'll take care of it for them. Just have the conversation ahead of time. You can surely pay for all those inspections, pre-inspections, and you can surely do that at a 7% listing, right? Mm -hmm. Or an 8% listing, not a problem. You have that built into your business. Paul, I know you have a question. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, um, I'm new to this um, and I just have a question. I have a buyer that he's getting pre-qualified. At mm -hmm. what point of that transaction you start to let them know, hey, you need to come up with these amount of money for like inspection and all these type of expenses? So you want to have that, guys. So when we're talking about money that needs to be paid by your buyer, and also, so let me just, I'm going to sidetrack. We're going to talk about this right now. So we're going to hold off on appraisals. We're going to talk about this because this right now, guys, is imperative. This needs to be have, had in the very beginning. So when I'm going through and I'm having my buyer consultations, this is, and this is what I tell them, guys, you are going to come out money for home inspections. This can be anywhere from, you know, 600 to you know, $1,500, depending on the specific property, because if you're going to be, if it's a, if it's a veteran, you're going to need a WDO, you're going to need a full home inspection included in that. If you want the discount on insurance, you're going to want a, a wind mitigation and a four point, which a, a home inspector should be able to do all three of those, except for the WDO. And if it's on a septic or well, you're going to have to do those as well. So you're talking about having to come up money for about six inspections max, right? 
that needs to be done in the beginning. Like, hey, you can spend up to $2,000 on. Now, keep in mind, and this is what you're going to tell your people, that money is non-refundable. This is the money that you are investing and you are not going to get that money back when you are having, when you are going through your inspections. So keep that in mind that you're not going to get that money back if you choose to walk away from the property. The same thing with your appraisal. Your appraisal is also going to be, you know, roughly, you know, five to seven hundred dollars, you know, and then you're going to need an escrow deposit that you have to put in within the first three days of being executed under a contract. So I tell my people, you're going, you know, if, depending on the price point, I mean, you're going to probably come up about, you know, anywhere from five to six thousand dollars that you're going to have to come out of, out of pocket for because you're going to want to do about one percent of the purchase price, whatever that is. So if it's a three hundred thousand dollar house, you're talking about three grand, you know, another five hundred dollars for an appraisal, you're at thirty five hundred plus whatever you need for your inspections. So that's money that you want to put out. Like you want them to know a hundred percent in the beginning, because once you said like, oh, well, you have to put up $3,000 for an escrow deposit. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, we never discussed this, you know, hey, I need, you need to do an inspection. Well, I didn't, I didn't know I had to pay for that. Those are conversations you want to have in the very, very beginning. So as he's going this pre going through this pre-approval process, you want to make sure that he can account for that amount of money because this is not money that's going to go towards the down payment either or the closing costs. Your appraisal, depending on the appra um, on the appraiser. Now, if you use Ali, EXP agents in Florida, he reimbursed your clients for their appraisal. Woo! Ooh, sorry, Ali, I love you. I had to put that out there. But, you know, so... You know, for EXP agents, they do that. However, that's going to come, you know, some other lenders, they'll give it to them as a credit for their appraisal at closing. So you may need to make sure that when you're talking to your lender partners, find out what do they do based on your customer's appraisal? Um, is it considered, you know, do they get a credit at closing for it? But that needs to be discussed in the very, very beginning. I hope I made that clear. Does anyone have questions about that? So um, I'm going to add to that, Liz, which I think is is good for us today. If we're on the buy side, just realize even though we are through a shift and it has shifted, one to three percent of the purchase price should be our escrow money that the buyer mm -hmm. places. Yeah. That is a strong contract when they see people putting money down. Yeah. Do not do yourself a disservice on a four, five, or six hundred thousand dollar house oh, and just put a grand or two grand down. That is not really and truthfully being mindful of your buyers. Yeah, Liz, slap yourself because she has watched, you know, negotiations go south when that happens. And mm -hmm. it's also a disservice to all parties involved in the, in the transaction. What's interesting is when we you are in your buyer consultation, make sure you have a packet together that you're leaving with them. And in that packet, there's a flow chart of things to come. You know, there's a flow chart. You can find them online everywhere. Google it. You know, a buyer's pathway, you know, flow chart. They're all out there. So it's, it's nothing that's new. Revise it to yourself so that they know what's up and coming. Mm -hmm. In that consultation, letting them know how much out of pocket you place yourself in a position to be of maximum service to them, because then you'll be making sure that you're mindful of the money that they're putting out. And if that makes them stressed, you need to know that Yeah, because they will walk away from a contract quicker than nothing if you haven't asked the right questions or done, your, done your homework. So two things that I want to touch on, guys. First, I want to answer Tina's question. It says, in today's market, can they escrow $1,500 and then the balance of three to five? Yes. So you can split up. You can do a second escrow. So if you want to say, hey, we'll do $1,500 within the first three days. And then after the inspection, within 10 days, we have a second escrow deposit. I know Florida Florida Far Bar, they do that. You can add a second escrow um, in a certain amount of days. So yes, you can do that 100%. Um, I've had clients do it on my contracts. I've done it on other, uh, you know, for my buyers. Also guys, keep in mind, your escrow, I'm not sure if, you know, a lot of new agents don't know this. That is also the money that your, sell, your buyers are willing to risk as well. Keep that in mind. If they, if they lose, if, 
guys, you guys know, I've talked about it before. I had a buyer commit mortgage fraud. <laughs> like that's just what it is. And they put a $5,000 deposit down guys. Yeah. Found out the day before closing. It sucked. It sucked. But here we are. <laughs> um, lost five grand because they didn't do their due diligence to fulfill the contract. There was no ands, ifs, or buts about that, guys. So if you have a client who puts down a $10,000 escrow, understand that if they, for whatever reason, that they don't perform or whatever the case is, that money can go to the seller and most listing agents will fight for it. So just make sure you're having those conversations as well, as well in your, um, when you're having your consultations. Liz, I'm going to step in if you don't mind. Uh, yes. If we can have Joe or Tiffany, if it's easier, put the buyer consultation in there, the link that George always shares. Guys, we've been, we've been talking about this for a long time. This is not the first time we are having this conversation. This is the reason why we keep on doing Monday to Friday Mastermind so you guys know exactly what to do before getting yourself in trouble, losing your buyer's money, and losing your license. This is where... People like us who've been in the business 17 years ago, we're going to come after every penny that's left on that table. It's not for us. It's for the seller because so it's not seller's fault that the buyer's the agent did not do his job. His lender did not provide them what they need to provide. So please, like, you know, we cannot emphasize this not enough that learn your skills. Your skills make you what you are. What the, uh, your skills are going to make you survive this shifting market. Uh, if you don't change your sell, uh, skills, you will be part of that 350,000 agents that's going to be out of business in the next year and a half. So please, I cannot. If somebody wants to have a deep down conversation, a basic Zoom call with me and Liz, we will be happy to do. I already put Liz in the, uh, uh, I didn't even ask her. I'm just putting her on the spot. We would love to have a basic conversation. Yes. And we've done this multiple times. And I know with this on Thursday, uh, emerging agent scenario that we're doing, we will be talking about this over and over. And it's, I don't think how many times we have talked about this. I can't even tell you how many times. And if you go back and look up the YouTube channel, uh, Joe, if you can put that YouTube link in there, all the videos are there. They have descriptions. You can look at it, watch it. You got to get your skills sharpened, guys. I cannot emphasize this enough. Yeah. Go ahead, Liz. I, guys, and if you don't know the, like, if you don't understand it, go into the world, guys, have a conversation with the broker because the broker, they're there. That's what they're there for. You know, we, so if not, talk to your sponsor, talk to your upline, call me, call Claire, call George, call whomever. Well, George is busy, but you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, have conversations with people who have been, call deep, don't call, oh, he said, don't call deep. I call deep all the time. He answers the phone. So, you know, Lizette, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put you there too. Call Lizette, like call the people who have been in this business to make sure that you're never putting yourself in a liability, in a liability issue, guys. Like it is so important because there's a lot there. We make so much money, but we can get sued just as quickly. And I never want you to put yourself in a position where you just made a $9,000 commission check. And now you have to pay that plus attorney fees. I want to do that. Lizette, I love you. I love you too, mama. Hi, everybody. Yes. Um, I One thing I do want to say is that, you know, probably we should have a class on do's and don'ts and why a buyer consult. A lot of people skip them. They get, they get in the rush and the adrenaline. Hey, I've done it too. Listen, the temptation is there. It's like that candy store, right? I'm re they're ready to rock and roll. We're just going to show houses. But the problem is once you go through the process and something happens, you remember this is exactly why I don't skip the buyer console. Yeah. And also have a checklist of all the things that are must. There are things you must cover on your buyer console. If anything you say, you have to cover, you know, the payment, like what's the average payment? You know, they want to look at how's that? Well, you know what? Do you know what the payments on these houses is going to be? You know, yeah. oh, but the payment's $3,000. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a $400,000 house, you know, taxes went up, you know, HOA, blah, blah, blah. So um, I just wanted to add on to what you're saying, just kind of put some fluff on it, but just, it's true. Absolutely. Absolutely. So guys, please. please Liz. Please. Yes, Liz. I'm going to hop in because I think that Lizette said something good. And since um, 
I am one of the committee members for training, the in, in-person training that we are doing once a month. I have placed that on our calendar just to let everybody know that we will dive deep on the buyer consultation so far as inspections, appraisals, and the consultation. We'll probably do that in March because everything else to March has already been filled. And y'all are getting yes. excited. We've got great stuff coming up. Guys, please, guys, if it's one thing I never want you to put yourself in a position is to lose your buyer's escrow because of inspection reports, guys. Um, and then now we're going to, uh, does anyone have any other questions about inspections? Because I want to get over to the appraisal side of it. And oh. um, any questions? You can raise your hand, put them in the chat box really quick. I need a bunch of inspections and differences calls. Okay. Uh, Tina, I believe you're here in the Orlando market, right? Ah, my will, my main man will. Yes, my darling. I am in Orlando. Okay, um, I'll text you. Uh, I'll text me after the call, okay, and we'll get together. You. Thank you, Will. Hey, just uh, just something to add to the inspection thing as far as um, we've talked about it in here, but maybe you can expound a little bit on it. As a seller's agent, when the buyer wants to send you the full inspection report with all the stuff that's wrong with it, you need to say, mm -mm, no, 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 don't want it. Don't yes. want it. Just guys, explain a little bit about why and how to handle that. Yes, guys. So <laughs> thank you so much, Will, for bringing that up, guys. Your home inspections are owned by your buyers. Let's make that perfectly clear. The owner of that home inspection is not you, it is the buyers. If the so when you are going through and you first you're you're talking to your buyer and they're like, "Hey, we want this AC fixed." It is not your it is it it does not belong to you. You need to ask first the buyer's permission. Hey, can I share this part, part of the inspection report with the sellers? You are only going to do a snippet of, you know, use the little clip thing or whatever and only send that report, that part of the report over to the listing agent for their sake of knowledge. As a, like, if you send me a home inspection as, as and I'm the listing agent, I'm like, oh. Like, I don't have to do anything. I already know what's going on. So I'll tell my seller, you can cancel if you want to, because we have the full home inspection. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to be slimy. You just didn't know what you were doing. And you sent me a full report that was owned by your buyer. Your buyer can come back and get you. Like, are you kidding me? Now, if the, if the seller wants a copy of the home inspection, you just say, you can pay me the $500 that I paid for it. And you, it's, I'm more than happy to share it with you. Guys, please, please don't send full home inspections to the listing agents. You are just biting yourself in the ass. I'm confused. <laughs> Why exactly can we not send full home inspections to the listing agents? Because it doesn't belong to you. It is owned by the buyer. You have to get their permission. Now, if they, if right, they with, say, with hey, permission. yeah, if they say, hey, you can send them the whole thing, I wouldn't advise my clients to send a full home inspection because they can say, you know, it's just, Claire, do you want to speak on this? <laughs> Thank you, Mom. Okay, so Holly, there have been situations in Florida where even with the buyer's permission have turned over the whole inspection report over to the seller. They mm -hmm. posted it online and the home inspector did not give permission for that to happen because of proprietary information, which leaves every agent and every person a part of that transaction open for liability. The only portion that needs to go back to the seller are the defects and the things that the buyer has requested in repair and replacement agreement form only, yeah. only because unless that home inspector and the buyer have approved that the full report be gone and transferred and be open, that home inspector cannot allow that because it's open liability for many licensed situations. I know that that kind of doesn't make sense. I had a situation, you know, where a whole report was sent when I was the broker manager of a whole firm. They sent the whole report over. I had told the agent not to do that. They did it anyway, because they had received the information and the 
the seller posted it online and slammed the inspector, the buyer, and the agent, all of them, publicly on Facebook. Wow. Hmm. No, ma'am. Do not Got send it. a but full report. They... Do not open yourself up to liability. Because just like yeah. Liz said, it could be a doorstop. And that will tweak somebody's head to go off in the wrong quadrant. And, and it's just not a good business practice at all. And it is not ours to be able to deliver. We must educate. Hmm. Another yeah, thing is that sometimes, sometimes, sometimes less is more. We don't always have to give everything. As a listing agent, I don't want the full report. Just tell me what your buyer wants. Give me a list and just send it to me. Yeah. Well, on that, and to that point, I could see where a listing agent wouldn't want the full report because then now everyone is aware of the issues and they have to disclose if the, if exactly. the contract falls through. But on the buyer's side, that would be an advantage to them because now you've got all these issues that if you back or, you know, if you don't fall in line and fix this, this shit, now you're going to have to disclose this. So, I mean, it's interesting. I, it's an interesting point, Claire. Um, oh, up here, and, it seems like we always send the full report. I've never seen a partial report sent, but um, it's worth a, th a think. I mean, I guess my question is like, what could, I mean, there's plenty of things that they could leverage and post online and blast people. I feel like there's plenty of opportunity for that, but so the other thing to add to that, Holly, is this, okay? When we're used to receiving those things, think of it this way as well, all right? Let's say we have a seller who is highly analytic, and because we're a great listing agent, we had proposed to them to get a pre-listing inspection, all right? So then they've got two reports in front of them. So what are they going to say? I'm not accepting that buyer. They got an inspector who's, who's out of their mind because my report is better than their report. That's another open of liability. OK, your license is on the line. There are many sellers that will look at a report that has been sent to them. And I've had people do it behind my back. I've had agents because they knew the sellers and they were friends. They sent them the report without me knowing it, you know, because here in Jacksonville, you know, we're like a, the largest small town in the world. And they literally slammed the inspector and said that inspector is inadequate and I don't accept this report. I'm canceling the contract. I don't want to sell to these buyers because they don't use reputable people. It's it's tough. Claire, if you don't mind, I want to jump in. Uh, I totally agree what uh, what you say, but at the same time, going back to what Holly was mentioning, and sometimes I've noticed on my end when I represent buyers, uh, and when they need, I always get, first of all, I always get permission from the buyers before I even do anything. If mm -hmm. I'm going to share that document, and even with the AC company to get a quotation, get an idea of what we're talking about. But when it comes to a listing agent, I've noticed, and I would say my ratio will be 80 to 90% uh, high in that range, saying that I get more done looking at that inspection report for the listing agent and kind of scares them and leave a very open-ended conversation. So it gives me more leverage to go negotiate. I've noticed that even in today's market. Uh, and, and I know it's it's kind of not the standard. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm getting calls, I'm on a phone. Uh, not a standard uh, practice, but it has worked for me in the long run. I know it, uh, I'm not a standard kind of guy, so uh, it mm -hmm. does work for me in the long run because uh, it, it, it makes sense. Uh, sometimes the seller agent don't know much. They panic more. They create the panic with the seller that they're gonna walk away. Let's fix this problem. So it kind of works. Uh, it works uh, sometimes, not all the time, but it's not a bad thing to do as long as the buyer approves it. I didn't realize it's 9 34. We can talk about this all day. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Because I'm probably going to have to talk about appraisals in like five minutes. <laughs> any other questions, guys? So there was one private message that came to me. Tina asked, where can we see the calendar for training? Um, and if you I'm go on it. our GPS website, because we have visitors on here, but if you go to our GPS website and click on the header at the top, 
that is fourth from the left that says calendar coaching training. The calendar comes up and you can see when the Central Florida training in person occurs. Perfect. Okay, guys. So really quick, let's jump to appraisals. Um, so guys, if you are, if if you have, if you're representing the buyer and you're going through and it's an FHA loan or a VA loan, or you have a conventional person that has an appraisal contingency, guys, this is what I was talking about in the very beginning where I said, you want to do your due diligence uh, prior to showing whatever properties to make sure that, you know, they're at value or below before you're submitting an offer. Um, for FHA, you know, if you have a FHA buyer or a VA buyer here in Florida, we have Rider E, which is going to be your FHA, um, uh, your basically your appraisal contingency, and it also has repairs of a certain amount on there. I typically do five hundred dollars for um, appraisal repairs in the event that the appraisal, you know, that something comes up on the appraisal report. Now, um, the appraiser's job is to come in and assess the the value of the property, right? Um, they will say, hey, you know, we did this appraisal. However, um, it has this issue and it needs to be fixed in, for, in order for the loan to go through. Um, I noticed a lot in the past two years, most people left the, um, the uh, appraisal repair part of it where the dollar amount for the sellers to pay blank or put zero. Don't do that. Don't do that. Put some kind of dollar amount on there, guys, because if not, if the sellers don't repair it, that means the buyers are stuck with it and they have to be the ones to pay for it prior to going into a home that they don't even own yet. You never want to put your buyers in a situation where they're paying for repairs or doing things other than inspections on a property that has, and they don't even own it yet. So make sure you're doing that. Uh, one, what line is that on the contract? This is not on the contract. This is so when you go down, if you're in Florida, page 11, you have the section where it says addendas. It's going to be Rider E if you're in Florida, and then you're going to have a, sec a separate an addenda, a separate addenda, which is going to be addenda, um, your FHA VA um, Rider. On that page, it says check to see if it's FHA financing, check to see if it's VA financing. There's right above on the first section, it's gonna talk about um, uh, appraisal repairs and there's a little there's a little dollar sign and there's a line. Always put some kind of amount in there, guys, um, just because you never wanna bite yourself in the tushy, you know, where someone gets stuck uh, because the sellers are like, hey, well, they can put it there, so we're not doing any repairs for this appraisal. Therefore, we're going to cancel and then you don't have a contract anymore. So make sure you're protecting yourself that way. Um, for FHA and VA, that one is that document is strictly for FHA and VA. However, you do have another appraisal contingency for your um, for your conventional or even cash, whoever, whoever else is going to do some kind of an appraisal. Um, there is not an amount that you can put on there because it's just saying that the value of the home has to appraise for this amount. Also, guys, keep another thing. This is your buyer's out in the event that you don't get out during the inspection period. So if your appraisal comes in lower than whatever that value is, the buyers get to go through and say, hey, you know, let's say the house is, you guys are under contract for 300,000 and the appraisal comes back in at 290,000. This is what's going to happen. You're going to go back to negotiations, right? So you say, hey, we have an appraisal for 290. We're under contract for 300. As the buyer's agent, I'm like, is your buyer willing to come down to 300? I mean, to 290 from the 300. The seller, they're going to put the listing agent is going to present it. They're going to say the seller said, hell no, they want this amount. You're going to say, okay, are you willing, you know, you're going to talk to your clients and you're going to find out if they're willing to one, meet in the middle or meet at some point. Number one, number two, they're just like, hey, they we're not willing to pay over appraised value because we don't have the extra cash to give up to pay over appraised value. So we're going to cancel and get our escrow back or C, the seller, you know, you're just going to cancel because no one comes to terms. 
or you're going to say, hey, I'm willing to pay the 300, even though it's worth three, you know, 290, I'm willing to still pay that so we can move to for go forward. However, understanding that if they're willing to pay anything above the appraised value, they are not going to get a loan for that. So they need to come up with that cash. Do they have that cash? And that's the conversation that you need to have with your buyers and their lender. Like, okay, how much money do like a lot of buyers agents? I don't know why they don't like to have financial conversations with their clients. Guys, this is what's going to separate you from the rest. Have the conversations with the lender. Do they have money for, you know, do they have money for a down payment? Do they have money? Do you know, do they need help with closing costs? X, Y, and Z. How much reserves do they have to use towards this transaction? Have those conversations so you know ahead of time before going under contract, what your client needs and how you can help them and best serve them. Um, but that's going to allow your clients in the event that the home comes in lower, they need to, you know, you guys need to go back to negotiations, whether it's move forward, meet in the middle or cancel. Um, so in the beginning, Uh, remember, like you, so as an as is contract, it's not that you need to buy the property as is. You can still repair, you can still request repairs and still request, you know, you can still negotiate things like that. So don't feel like you can't use the as is contract. That's typically what I use. I know some others, they use the other Florida, um, Florida contract. I just use the as is one. That's just what I've been doing for the past couple of years. Um, so yeah, but appraisals, guys, um, typically, how much money? How much? Money? So it just depends, Marissa. Like you can go through. Um, I typically just do a you know a standard of five hundred dollars. Like some people they do more, some people do less, some people put zero. Um, I just always like to put a decent amount where the the bot the sellers will be willing to pay that to fix any appraisal repairs that need to be completed in order for the loan to go through. I feel like I've been babbling for an hour and a half. Does anyone, I mean, does anyone have any other questions about appraisals, any topics that they want to bring up um, and go from there? Guys, if you have questions about appraisals, please don't let this time constraint um, stop mm -hmm. you. If anything, go ahead and throw them into I the chat. Time. I, I have, have already, Liz has offered additional time and I've already sent an email to George like, hey, Series seven has got to be broken up because inspections needs its own appraisals yeah. and needs its own. So, yeah. But any other questions? I have a question. Oh. I have a, do you guys, so I'm in Georgia, many of you are in Florida. Um, I have one of my agent friends down there. Seems like she's always going to the appraisals. And up here, I don't know anyone that goes to the appraisals. So like, that's, that's not a thing. So yes. what's the deal? So for me as a listing agent, and this is something that, again, this is why we need extra time to talk about appraisals. As a listing agent, I am at every single appraisal. That is my due diligence to my seller. I am going to be at every single appraisal because if I know for a fact that we listed the property a little higher, I need to fight for value. So I'm there like, hi, Mr. and Mrs. Appraisal. How, Mr. and Mrs. Appraisal, how are you? I want to have a conversation with you. I want to get to know you. Oh, you know, um, I always provide my comps to my appraiser to say, hey, here's are the comps that I use. You know, do you mind if I give you, share with you my comps so that I can provide to you to, to see where, how I got, um, I came up with my value. At that point, the appraiser should already have a copy of the contract so they know what we're under contract for, right? So I wanna fight for value as much as possible to get my seller top dollar so we don't have to worry about an appraisal coming in short so that we have to potentially do a price, for, you know, um, a decrease in the price. Fred, I, I love when Fred gets on the phone and wants to chat with us. Hey, um, Holly, I, that's a great question. Um, I do a whole thing. I have a whole checklist, a meet, meet appraiser checklist. I, I always get their name, their address, their email address ahead of time. And they get an email from me with all the HOA information. They get photographs. They, they get a link to all the photographs they get. And not that they need the photographs because they're going to take their own or required to, but I, I send them a, a list of improvements and I send them the comparables that I use. And I just say, hey, listen, this may help. I do everything I know that they have to go research. Like when I send them the HOA information, that saves them 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And boy, you just scored big with the appraiser. Every appraiser, when I used to sell, um, 
I've actually gotten people call me saying, hey, I want to list my home. And I go, oh, how did you get my name? Oh, Joe, the appraiser gave it to me. Mm-hmm. I said, oh, well, thank you very much. I called Joe up. So definitely, um, you know, I've saved many, many potential problems by being there and creating a relationship. Um, so I encourage that whenever it's possible and then do their work for them as much as you can. Uh, give them the tax. I give them the tax roll. I give them the uh, HOA information. I give them the list of improvements. I, I mean, it's just like I, I get I used to get back all the time. And my agents that use the checklist, not all of them use it. Uh, they get compliments from the appraiser. Oh, my gosh. And then I and I plus I show up with that stuff duplicated in a folder and with their name on it. They just are blown away. So that's my advice. Yep. So I always how, yeah. Go so ahead, how are you guys, how are you guys finding out even when the appraisals have, because I feel like every time in the transaction, I don't know when it's happening until so, it's already happened. <laughs> so for me, um, I'm very like, as the, as, so as the listing agent, I'm very involved in the transaction with, when it comes to the lender, because I need, I, 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 Call me whatever you want. I'm like, I am very anal when it comes to my buyer, like to my list, to my sellers to make sure that, but you know, the lending side is going through because I never want well, them to drop the ball. So I'm. Well, how do, how do, yeah. Uh, Holly, how do you, uh, cause when I, if, I, if I'm the listing agent, I put myself down as a contact person to get access to the house. When, you know, when the, you know, I make sure that the buyer, the bro agent, uh, and the mortgage company knows I'm the contact for the appraiser to get access to the house mm-hmm. um you, you don't do that i'm trying to think I mean, i've only them. done two listings and i'm I oh can't okay. remember how okay. the appraisals got yeah, in I just put so they have, the typically the appraiser has to schedule it with the listing agent so for okay. me yeah yeah however like yeah. even on the buy side like i'm you know when i'm on the buyer side i'm calling the listing agent because i'm not there for the buyer's appraisal if the listing agent isn't there you know what I mean? So if the listing, you know, and for me, that's a value prop when I'm going to to get any listing. I'm like, I will be at the, I will be at the appraisal X, Y, and Z. Like th- these are, these are the things that I'm going to do. But the, one of the things on there is being present at the appraisal as a listing agent, because I need to fight for value if I know that we're marketing. A little, so they have to contact me and they schedule it with me. Now on the buy side, they reach out to the lender and say, Hey, the, you know, the lender goes through their portal, they schedule it. So I'm touching base with the lender. Like, Hey, is the appraisal scheduled? Is the appraisal scheduled? Is the appraisal scheduled? They're like, yep, it's this day at this day. And then I'm communicating. Once I find out that my buyer's paid for the appraisal, I'm reaching out to the listing agent saying, Hey, buyers just paid for appraisal. Um, they should be reaching out to you. Can you please let me know when it's scheduled for? And I put it on my Google calendar and I'm like, okay, the appraisal is scheduled for this day. And then I have a conversation with the listing agent. I'm like, are you going to be present? If I know that we're like, if I know for a fact that we're listing, we're under contract for something a little higher. I know that my people can't really fight whatever the hell the case is. If we can get whatever the case is. And they're like, hey, I'm going to be there. Okay, great. If they're not going to be there, I'm like, it's not my job to be at an appraisal for a seller because I think if it comes in lower, that's your fault, not mine. But I would rather be there just to try to help fight it to see if we can get as much value for it. So I will go to my buyer's appraisals if the listing agent isn't there to ensure that we get top dollar for the property so we can avoid going back to square one for negotiations. Because some people are just like, hey, this is my top dollar. I'm not removing a cent under it. This is just what it is. So I'm like, okay, well, somebody got to fight for value because we're, you know, you guys are over, we're under contract for something that's overpriced friend um i think he had just left his up i wanted to piggyback on everything that liz just said i have always found out when the appraisal is from Mm -hmm. the lender um on the buy side always found out Mm -hmm. and there have been times where i did not i found out from the lender when the appraisal was i did not follow up with the listing agent ahead of time and it bit everyone in the ass because it came in, we got hit with a Tidewater appraisal. It was VA, it came in under. And then because of that, it affect, It definitely affected my buyer because then the seller said, sure, we'll drop the price, but now we're removing closing costs, like this concessions. We lost yeah. 2%. And then I, it was still on my buyer and my side to scramble like, whoa, we just lost 2%. Yeah. 
not one, not just flat fee, like 2%. Where are we going to get that from? So yes, it is important to communicate ahead of time. Yes. So that someone is there because had I known, at least I would have known ahead of time, even then it, it, just knowing would have been nice knowing that the agent wasn't going to be there because yeah. I was trained by you guys. So I assumed <laughs> the listing yeah. agent was going to be there. And she apparently said, no, there was a lockbox on the property. They just gave the appraiser the lockbox code. He let himself in, did his thing. And that's why I think it's important because a lot of people, you know, right now when we're going into, you know, in the market that we're in, that we're able to get closing costs and able to get repairs and everything like that. Guys, this is another thing that to keep in mind when it comes to not just the appraisal, but when it comes to the inspection is before we go under contract, you know, we know that our buyer needs 3% towards closing costs and everything. When we come through and we have this crazy inspection that is nine, you know, 90 pages long and we need not just a roof and AC, a water heater. They're like, sure, we'll do those things, but we're taking away all of your closing costs. Or the same thing with an appraisal. Oh, you know, it came in $10,000 lower. It came in $20,000 lower. We're willing to sell it at that price, but we're taking away the closing concessions. So that's why for me, it's so important to not only have the, if the listing agent isn't going to be there, that I'm present, or if I'm the listing agent, be present at the, at the appraisal, because most appraisers, they're not going to be like, oh, I don't want your comps. They'll take them from you. They're like, oh, absolutely. Give me what you got. Give me what you got. And they'll go through and they'll review everything and say, okay, you know, this one makes sense. This one makes sense because the one thing (laughs) that you probably don't ever want to come across is having to rebuttal a appraisal. You have to contest an appraisal. Appraisers don't like it. And for VA, the appraisal is the appraisal. What it is, is what it is. It sticks no matter what. FHA appraisals, if you can contest it and you can get some kind of value up or whatever the case is, hallelujah, praise Jesus. Oh my God, you have hit, like, you are the man. However, most of them are just like, nope, nope. The value is what it is. And on FHA appraisals, guess what? They stick for six months. I learned they so much the value is the value. about when oh, the appraisal process, because we got hit with the tidewater in my area, we are in this region. We are also known as tidewater, Virginia. So I get the call saying, Hey, uh, appraiser got back to us and they're going to tidewater it. So we have five days to give them comps. And I was like, what does that even mean? Please tell me, what does that mean? Basically the appraiser said, I don't see what you guys are seeing. So it's going to come in low. You can try to provide comps to help me see what you saw. Yep. But initially it's like a, it's a huge red flag. It's not like a low. It's, I don't see how you guys came up with that number in my opinion. <laughs> and it happened to me back to back Tidewater on two properties on the buy side. So, so- Please be careful, guys. Yeah, I cannot. And this is why, again, like I'm going to bring it back full circle before you guys show any property, guys. Like, I know we get excited. Just like, yes, I'm about to go show a property. Oh my God, I hope to get it under contract. X, Y, and Z, blah, 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 blah. Do your due diligence. And like, I'm not saying do a full CMA. Like, okay, this is going to be a praise that 442.65. You know what I mean? I'm not saying do that, but have a general number. Like, okay, I'm running it right now. Just want to pull comps on the neighborhood. These are the actors and sold. I think it's going to come anywhere between three, 325 ish or whatever. It's listed at 350. Oh, sweet baby Jesus. It better, you know what I mean? Like, you want to know that beforehand so that before you go into the, you know, just be, just protect yourselves, guys. I want to save you all the headache. Um, I'm trying to think anything else that I need to talk about appraisals. Just be present if you're the listing agent. Do your do. guys do your job. Like do your job. Just be at the appraisal. Fight for value if you know that you're listing it high, especially if you're listing it high. If it's a cash deal, most cash buyers they don't need an appraisal. I had one on my listing that they need. They it was a cash buyer. They want an appraisal, so we did it. I mean, we're fine, but. Most cash transactions don't need an appraisal. Um, sometimes you have conventional buyers who are putting 20% down. They'll have an appraisal contingency in there, but then they'll get an appraisal waiver. Even better. Well, if you can get an appraisal waiver from any of your clients, amazing, fabulous job. Um, but mm-hmm. for FHA, VA, and, and conventional, you're going to need it. 
Marissa, you have yeah. your, you put a question into the chat and then we'll go to Alethea. Marissa's okay. question was, how do you keep your concessions when the appraisal comes in short? Negotiations. That's negotiations. Negotiations. Negotiations, 100%. Yep. You want to have those conversations um, and just be real. Like as long as you have that report with the client, you know, with that other side saying, hey, you know, we understand that you want to take away the concessions, but if we don't do this, then they just, we they, they won't sell. Is that yeah. something that they want? Do they want to go on the market for, uh, you know, do they want to go back on the market? Do you want to disclose what the appraised value is? Do you want to, you know, wait an additional 30 to 60 days to close? Most people will just say, hey, you know, let me talk to my clients, see what's up, you know, see if there's something that we can come to happy median. Yeah, it is. It is all negotiations on that one. But that's also like Liz says, if you have good rapport, if you have been a jerk to the other side the whole time, high and mighty. I'm sorry, you probably flat out lost your concessions. Um, but as long as it's been kind of cool the whole time, then like Liz said, it's an honest conversation. Um, and just making sure, hey, that we're all aware of the ramifications if we part ways. Yep. So just having that conversation. And in my opinion, most times it's going, the other agent, of course, is going to understand. And ultimately it's not their decision. It is the seller's decision. Yep. So it does help that you have that good relationship with the other agent because their delivery of that proposal yep. is crucial for your success. So Absolutely. if you're a jerk to that agent, they're not going to be all fun and happy. Like, hey, guess what? We, they still need help. They're, they're not going to do it. Instead, they're going to be like, listen, I know it sucks that I came in shorter and that you want to pull back, but I spoke to the other agent. And if you do, this is what's going to happen. And this is how it directly negatively impacts you. That's what hopefully happens. Again, if you have good rapport, right. that agent will soften the blow on the other side. And hopefully the negotiations will go well, because again, at the end of the day, it's not even our negotiations. It's how we are presenting that information to the other side. Keep that in mind. Olivia, you have your hand up. There are a lot of questions. I love this. I know. Yes. Um, and I apologize if Liz, you may have answered this question. I just, I think I'm, I'm thinking too deep into it. So I have a contract. We're in at 275. If the mm -hmm. appraised value comes anything under that, so we're just it's not fingers crossed. This isn't the scenario. It's just part of the question. Um, say it comes in 250, 25 under. Mm -hmm. And my guys don't have that 25, right? The, the and thing. obviously, like that's the negotiation, right? Coming back mm -hmm. to the listing agent, and we would just kind of go over that. If her seller says, look, I'm not going down at all, we're staying at that 275 no matter what. And my guys are like, okay, you know, I'm not going to be able to get funded. I definitely don't have the cash. My debt to income, all that good stuff would change. Does this keep their earnest money deposit safe that they could pull out? Yes. Okay. Yes. This is go okay. so. This is this is the part of the. This is what I was talking about a little bit before, and I do apologize if mm -hmm. I can go into it. This is your buyer's scapegoat. If the appraisal comes in anything short and we can't come to terms, Oof. you guys can cancel the contract and the buyers will get their escrow back. Yes, because it's a financing thing. It's not something that they purposefully did, like my crazy people who did mortgage fraud. You know what I mean? Like if it's something yeah. that your people can't control and you can't come to terms with, they'll get their escrow back. But that would be, I'm fingers crossed that that's and not And that's without an additional addendum, correct? Like without any additional wording yeah. and additional- You just, okay, correct. You just go awesome. through Thank and you. you'll, um, you'll submit release and cancellation and you would put their escrow goes to the buyer. Oh my God, I love all the questions. This gets me so Thank excited. you so much. <laughs> okay, no, and I appreciate I have a question, all the but answers also, and info. Just a quick tidbit. What mm -hmm. is your financing for that, um, for that contract? Conventional. Conventional. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the conventional one, a little more, you know, they're a little more conservative. So the appraisers are a little more conservative for FHA and VA. They're very like, to so, a T, yeah. Okay. To a T. So with the conventional fingers crossed that you get it. However, for just for you guys, so you know, if it comes in lower, for example, in your case where it comes in, at, if it came in at 250, that value is going to stick on the property for six months. You would have to find a conventional or cash buyer who's willing to pay 25000 over. And are you really going to find that? 
Right. Okay. That's so that your, would be a big your, part of the negotiation. Correct. Right. Is, is are that, they that willing to sticking. sit on the market? Got are they it. willing to go back on the market and wait six because they have to disclose that it's on there for six months that an FHA appraisal, nobody's going to do that. So you have the power at that point. That is such great information. Thank you so much. No so problem. much. That was gold. No Holly. Okay. Two questions. One, um, when an appraisal, when a contract falls through, if the appraisal has been uh, shown to, to, yeah, and it's been shared with the sellers, um, if they go back on the market, does the listing agent and the sellers have, do they have to disclose the appraisal amount? I am discovered. almost, well, you're shaking your head. I don't, so. I'm not, a broker. I'm not a broker. So, I mean, it would be best to ask your broker in your area, but I don't think so. I think that's, I think that's confidential information. However, it de because the, so yes, I think it's going to vary from state to state. However, if it's coming in lower, like for FHA or VA or something like that, because definitely talk to the broker. I don't know the clear yeah. answer to that question. Okay. Follow-up question. Number two, this is my last question. So you guys said that the appraisal sticks for six months. For FHA and VA. Okay. For FHA and VA. Now, if the appraisal, let's say that again, the deal falls apart and then it goes back under contract for FHA or VA, do the next buyers still have to pay for another appraisal or do believe, they have to use the previous? So another, because like, where's Claire when I need her? I'm going to ask her. If it's I, this, it's I don't like, remember. If it's that one. Why this is Lori. This is Lori Ristoff. And you know, I, I have a broker's license, but I, I've been around a long enough time to understand that the appraisal belongs to whoever paid for it. Pay for it. The seller right. doesn't have any right to disclose that to anyone. And it only belongs to that buyer. So you don't even have any obligation to disclose that. It's the buyer's appraisal. They paid for it. So, Lori, I have a question for you, since, um, just out of curiosity, because it's coming, like, because the appraisal, oh, hi, Deep. Sorry, he just popped on and got me excited. Um, so if in the event that the appraisal comes through, because, so it's owned by the buyer, 100%, however, buyer. if they go back under, if they go back on the market and go back under contract, that appraiser is going to pull the previous appraisal, correct? And be able, yeah. and just, I'm sorry. No, why would, what do you mean they would pull So if it's that? FHA, if it's FHA. Oh, if it's FHA, um, that's an issue, you know, yeah. then, then it sticks. So you said it correctly, that it sticks with that for six months, I believe. So yes, yeah, but on conventional, you know. You can no, have another appraisal right, and that's fine. Right. And, yep. and technically, you know, it does belong to the buyer. So it's not something you have to disclose but if the seller gets another buyer with fha it's going to come up exactly so you might as well just yeah. right. not have to deal I with get, it twice Liz, i think right. it's it's three to four months not six months uh, yeah six months up maybe now. i three thought months it no, 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 no i thought yeah. it updated mm -hmm. where it's six months now no, Let maybe me it's something new that i don't know of I, but that's I, only on fha what happens it stays on the accounts so when the the lender or the appraiser puts the address in there, it populates and flags them. It says, we just got it. Uh, this was done a few months ago. And that's the time he will resubmit or however he wants to do it. Mm -hmm. So the seller, I mean, you know, as a listing agent, if you have that issue, you should always let the buyer's agent know who was going to be the next person in contract to say, hey, this is what happened. This is the reason what fell apart. Now, if it's conventional, uh, no, you cannot yeah. use that old one. Uh, they'll have to do a new one. Every lender is different. If you move the lender to a lender, they can use your buyer can use the same appraisal. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So if I don't know if I missed the maybe 20 minutes of the conversation. So I wasn't sure if somebody brought that up. If your lender to if your lender is switching, uh, as long as the uh, lender releases it, there's a way they do it internally. And yeah. that appraisal can go to the new lender. 
Correct. So the process switch, doesn't uh, the slow down. The fire switches it. Yep. Hey, I'm new, of course. I'm the one that's always asking the questions. <laughs> I do remember at the Aura, I, I took a class about three weeks ago, and it was a local attorney talking exactly about this about the appraisal is owned by the buyer and it's not allowed to go out to anyone. The seller can't know. I do remember that. And I totally remember them saying about the FHA um, and VA being available or like public knowledge or something crazy like that. I guess with lenders first six months. And that was about, that was about three or four weeks ago. But everything else was, you just brought this up and it just came back to me. So I do remember hearing that, that the buyer owns it, nobody else, unless they give permission to the seller to see it, know it, share it, all of that. But I really didn't get on to ask a question. I was just going to thank you guys because there's, I've learned so much with this morning mindset and all of these meetings. I mean, I'm, I've had a transaction and it, Thank God it was super smooth and they had no idea I was new and it was just, it was awesome. It was the best feeling. However, we say, or y'all say, get out there. It doesn't matter. Just go, go, go. And I am OCD and freaking out about all of this stuff that we have to really be educated on I mean, to, to be, like you say, value, to give value to your client. And I just, um, I don't know. I'm, I don't know what I would do if it weren't for EXP and their training. I mean, it's just phenomenal. But anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I always say get out of your own way, right? We yeah, complicate I'm things. my problem. Yeah. Yeah. So I tell that to everybody. I, I know there are a couple of other agents on the call. They, they overthink it. I'm like, why are you getting to that level? You haven't even have discussed yet. Why is right. there an appraisal issue when it's not even an issue? Exactly. You know, uh, you're overthinking. Just you know, create a checklist and follow the checklist, and that's all you need. Don't overthink for your well, client because it's going to backfire you. It's great to do that. It's great to have the knowledge, uh, understanding of the appraisal, how the inspection works and all that. But at the end of the day, it's it's pretty black and white. You're not the expert. You're not the appraisal expert. You don't have the license for appraisal. You don't have a license for insurance. You know, you can relay the message, yeah. uh, you know, and end of the day and give your uh, opinion. And, and, you know, what they say about opinions, everybody's got one. Sure. And, and my opinion and might be very different than compared to yours. I'm more conservative when it comes to my negotiation skills. You know, I, I'm very aggressive when it comes to that. A lot of people will be laid back, but that's my style and it works. You know, so you'll 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 get to a rhythm that it will be a flow for you because and it's pretty much every deal. It's the same thing. It might be a different problem, but the process is the same. Yeah, the process. Yes, I love it. I mean, I'm learning so much and I am um, I'm getting out there, <laughs> but you're right. I, the beauty of it is I don't have to be the expert, but I do feel that sellers and buyers, when you do know a little bit about what you're talking about, it can push away that whole lack of experience. And so if I could just have a little more info, that kind of thing. So that's why I'm thankful. I love everything on this. So thanks again, you guys. You're welcome. Yeah. I just wanted to say, uh, go ahead. Oh. oh, yeah. I just wanted to say, and I mean, like, I, I'm sure there's no one on here that hasn't made some mistakes. I mean, I had a situation recently. I won't go into too much, but, um, you know, I screwed up. I did something that, um, I should have known better and it got me in some hot water and I was able to smooth things over, but I mean, it, um, I'll never make that ma mistake again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was the discomfort. Well, I'll never forget how the tears <laughs> and how uncomfortable it made me and, you know, and how, how and it happens. Things got, so. but, it, but it happens guys. Like we all make mistakes. You know what I mean? I can tell you, I've made mistakes before. And I was just like, you, just like Holly said, I would never do it again. I'm sure Deep has made mistakes in his career. However, we, like, I know for a fact now, like moving forward, God, Deep is so extra. <laughs> but um, just guys, like, that's why I'm saying it's okay to say, hey, Liz, can you review this contract? Because I'll see something that you did it. Like I had an agent call me um, last week and was just like, yeah, you know, I'm so excited. I submitted an offer. We finally got this person under contract. And I know, I know some history about the client 
And when she's telling me about the offer, I said, well, did you put, um, did you talk to them about an appraisal contingency? Did you put that the it's contingent upon the sale of their home? And she goes, well, no. And I spoke to my mentor and they did it. I said, well, you know, forget that. This is what I'm trying to, you know, so I saw that for her, which God forbid, if I didn't catch that for her or had those conversations to walk through it, she could have went under contract and bit herself in the foot because God forbid the sale of that other house didn't happen. This contract that you have for them as the buyers are saying that they don't need to sell their house over there in order to buy this one, which was definitely not the case. So guys, don't ever feel embarrassed for saying, hey, can you go through and review this contract for me? Make sure I'm, you know, I'm good. I know if you are, if you're a newer agent and you have to go through your mentor or your sponsor or whomever, somebody is willing to help you. I'm always like, guys, send it to me really quick. I'll take a look at it. If just give me a little bit of information on it and we'll go from there. So I'm always willing to help, um, help guys. Um, I can't say every single time, but I will do my best to help you guys to make sure that you don't get big in the ass. Eddie, what's up, babe? Hey, so I wanted to just add, um, well, I have two things. One is, since we're talking about the appraisal, another code of protection that I put in my contract for my buyers is whatever contingency that I have, I'll put that first. And on the last line, I always put that the house um, property must appraise at um, agreed price. Uh, hold on. Property must appraise at agreed sale price. No, hold on. What did I say? Property must must appraise at above or agreed sale price, um, and then I would talk with the buyer and I would tell them in the case that the house is not appraised for, let's say three ninety nine, and it appraises for you know three eighty seven, do you have enough money to put in an appraisal gap? And they'll say they'll say yes or no, and if they say yes, I'll tell them okay how much would you like to put in an appraisal gap? And they'll tell me. So then in the contract, I will put property must appraise at or above agreed price, agreed sale price. Buyer is um, willing to put up to $10,000 of appraisal gap or whatever the amount that we agree on. Because um, one, it protects my buyer so that if it does come below and they still want the house and they really want the house. And they're basically saying to the seller, look, if it comes below, I'm willing to give you up to this amount to meet your sale price. And the market if that not, we're in now, the market we'll that we're in now, you don't need to do that. I and mean, we don't need to do that. Uh, and you, uh, right. Yeah, you're I'm, not. I think you're not listening to our conversations at all for the last four months. No, you're, no, no. The market is shifted. Whatever happened two years ago was different. I know. I'm just saying I, that's what I put in my contract. If it ever comes to the point where the buyer really wants the house and there's like negotiations or not. So let me I'm, ask you, what, what do you mean by contract? Do you mean a buyer consultation contract or you mean by actual sales contract? I'm talking about the sales contract. Why so, would you put that? If I know that on the listing agent part that you are already saying that you're going to pay 5,000 more or 10,000 more than the appraisal price, why would I even negotiate that? My seller will jump to sign that. Absolutely. You lost your negotiation tool right there. So in the previous two years, guys, that was something that we had to do like to win offers. 100%. Eddie, I love you. Don't do that anymore. Do not do that anymore. We are in a shifted market, guys, where we, people are not paying over appraised value anymore. This is, you have power. Your buyers have power. Don't give up their power just because the thing is, if they really want the property, let it get to the appraisal, let it get to the appraisal. And then we, and then we discuss that 100%. But right now in the market that we're in, do not talk, do not ask your buyers if they want to you know, have the conversation about it, but don't put it in the contract 100% because I, as a listing agent, would eat that all up. I'm like, oh, I know for a fact, like for me, I, I know for a fact that, that we listed high. I know for a fact that we listed high. So you're saying you're willing to pay 10,000 over appraised value to a, like for a maximum up to this? Absolutely. I'm like, guys, we know that we went on the market high. I told you we were going to sell for about this, but they're willing to give us up to 10,000 over. Hell yeah, let's take that because we know that we're going to appraise just around here and you're going to pocket an additional Don't Liz, do that anymore. Uh, yeah, it happened to me three months ago. Same exact deal. I had one showing in eight days, one showing. And they came from Tampa. 
uh, agent does enough business, but looks mm-hmm. like she's not keeping up with the market. They gave yeah. me 15,000 over appraisal value. Crazy. I just want to put it out there. I don't always put the appraisal gap coverage in there, but I always put that it must appraise at or above the agreed asking price. So you don't have to do that. Remember, if you have your appraisal contingency, if you have an appraisal contingency where you have your, for conventional, for in, so in Florida, we have um, rider, is it F? Oh my God. Is it F or I know E is the FHA one. And then there's the other one for like conventional, whatever that, or cash, whatever the hell it is. Um, those already right. have that on there. So I don't have to put any additional terms because I will tell you when you write shit in the additional terms, you are acting as a lawyer and you do not want to do that. Let me tell you, do not like I put in there, like property must be delivered in broom swept condition. Those are the, t- but I'm not going to sit there and put certain things in there because it is, you are interpreting, you are being a lawyer and you do not want to do that. You do not want to do that. Um, so they came out, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure most of you guys know, they came out with an addenda um, for that's whatever the case is, but here we are. Don't do that anymore. Don't, 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 don't. Eddie, you're right here. I'll, no, I'll, no, 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 no. I mean, the, the appraisal. Yeah, like word. if you have it checked but, off, if you have it checked off yeah. for on your contract that you have an appraisal contingency and there's an, an additional addenda on there, you don't need to write it in the additional term because it's at that point it's redundant. You don't need it. But when you're putting things in the additional terms, guys, that has to do with financing and everything, like the buyers have to, like, um, I took a class on it and they're talking about the, 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 the way it should be written is like, you have to talk about financing and this and that, like there's this whole paragraph that talks specifically about paying over appraised value that the way it gets into, and it, there was a bunch of crap, excuse me, the there was a bunch of shit that came up that bit a lot of people in the ass. So that's why I'm saying when it comes to the additional terms, be very, very clear. Go to the world, talk to the broker, ask them the exact verbiage that you they, they would want to protect you as the agent and your client, 100%. And the other thing that I wanted to put into, because I messed up on that part big time, was that to, when you're putting in an extension, the extension of closing is not the only date to extend. financing. So you will have to extend the financing. However, the case that I messed up on, the financing date wasn't secured yet and we were still good and I didn't extend that date. And so I didn't you know, connect with the lender to find out if we had met commitment at that time. And then about a week and a half later, my buyer's wife decided to quit her job. So then when we decided to do the extension, we had already passed the commitment date. So I should have had an extension prior to even her quitting her job, an extension for that commitment date. So they are losing their EMD regardless if they pull out from this from this deal because we did not make commitment for the financing. So if you're gonna do extensions, remember to put your commitments commitment date extension loan approval the whole nine guys like it's not just again thank you eddie for bringing that up like this is what we talk about all the time of knowing your contracts knowing your dates guys your calendar should be your best friend when you are going on your when you are going under contract something that i do i'm like okay this is execution date loan you know inspection date and again Everybody will argue with me. I like to do five o'clock because I don't want anybody to come and say, oh, you know, we're going to argue that it's five o'clock. Oh, we're going to argue that it's midnight. I just say five o'clock to cover my ass. Five o'clock on this day, the end of the inspection period, I put a reminder two days before, send calendar invites to all parties, not only to my buyers, to the T, to my transaction coordinator, you know, find out when the inspection time is so that we have that up, send it to all parties, email the agent, hey, the inspection is on this day, the inspection for the septic content, whatever the hell is, let everybody know all of the dates. When I'm sending out my emails for my initial emails, I'm CCing title, putting all of the important dates on their loan commitment, blah, 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 blah. Make sure that you're protecting yourself, guys, because in this case, they're going to, you know, God forbid they lose their escrow, they can get really upset and come back after her. You don't want to put yourself in that position. You yeah. do not want to put yourself in that position, guys. When's the next contract class? Um, I believe they have them in the world. Um, definitely take your contract classes, guys. Um, know your craft and know it well. 
That's all I can say. Know your craft, know it well. Um, I never want to see you guys in a position to be sued. I haven't. So I, I just put a contract in yesterday on a house. And before that, that the night that I put the contract in for for the most part of the day, I spent about three hours on the phone with my buyer going over the contract line by line by line. And then there's a part in there that says, um, if there's any oil or gas in the tanks at the house that it's going to be prorated. And so my buyer was like, we need to take that line out and take that whole sentence out. And I was like, uh, wait. <laughs> so she wanted, she didn't want to pay for the prorated oil and, t- and gas in the tanks. Now the house is actually a vacation home for my, for the sellers. The sellers are from Jersey and they usually come down to the shore. And so there's probably no gas or oil in there. And if there is, it's probably like 20 or $30 worth. And she was like, I want that line taken out. And so we then had to red redline it and have her put her initials next to it. So um, that part, I didn't even know was in my contract to tell you the truth. Cause I mean, I've gone over contracts with clients, but then for whatever reason, I've skipped that portion. Cause I don't know why, but now that I didn't skip it and I was actually reading it for real line by line by line, paragraph by paragraph, um, she wanted me to take that out. So now I'm, I'm a little, um confused about what needs to happen here because the agent called me and said so they don't cipher the gas that's in there so what is your buyer going to do like what does she want us to do and so my buyer basically wants her to just like what will said right now hold on i missed it you do not red line or anything that the verbiage that's in that contract thing is I've been told that redlining is altering the that contract and essentially no, no. is a no. Oh, the I've seen it done here. In should... It's done in Virginia a lot. And I've, I've received, um, like, for example, I've sent a contract in and then it comes back to me redline of, you know, what they want to do, what they don't want to do. And even when we were buying yeah, but house, is that on an agenda? what the her not paying for the no what they're like what they're redlining is it on an addendum like for repairs and stuff like that can you please explain what red line were you talking about Mm -hmm. so we can all uh, relate to that because kind of confusing what items were changed in that contract so so you can explain can you tell us so so the virgin contract itself that's already there they my buyer wanted to take out the last sentence saying that she, the purchaser, will pay a prorated rate for any oil and gas left in the tanks. And so she didn't want to do that. And she wanted to take that sentence out. And I was like, well, this is a pre-written PDF. I can't take it out. Did you, let me ask you, before redlining anything, did you talk to the broker first about redlining that? No, I didn't. Because we've done that here before. We've redlined things. They just want initials. if you redline yeah. something in there, they just want initials of both buyer hey. and seller to agree that. And that's fine. Can I, but Liz, Liz, hold yeah, on one ahead. second. Eddie, I know you keep on yeah. saying you've done that before. What changes did you make before? Forget this contract. I'm not talking about the gas and the oil. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you said you bought your house and you had red lines there, right? What was that changes? Yeah. Was it the amount? Was it the inspection date? Was it the closing date? Um. It was uh, inspections. It was stuff on the inspection addendum that we had. That's, that's, different. that's, that's what different. We're, that's different. so different. When You're it comes to yourself, was, yeah. Yes, when you, you can redline through, like, so on a contract, guys, we have pre filled areas that we are only allowed to touch those. That is the uh, closing date. Everything on that contract is written the way that it is. That's what it is. We are only allowed to change what is on those blank lines. We cannot go through and strike through a like a line that's in the contract. Or like Will said, you can go through and do it on an addendum, like write it up on an addendum, like that that like you know blah blah blah. blah. You don't want to do that on your contract. Now, if I'm cha- if you know if I go through and I'm right, I'm submitting an offer and I have a closing date for. 
September 1st or whatever the case is, they can redline through the September 1st closing date and change it to whatever date. Yes, they can do that, but to strict strike through an entire line that was created by the by the, the Virginia law, whoever the hell does the contracts and everything, you don't want to do that because you need to cover your ass. Now, for me, if you are going to do something like that, where you're striking through a, a con like a line through that, first, I'm talking a legal hotline and I'm talking to what's the and I'm talking to the broker because there is no way I'm changing anything on that contract that can come back because they're like, oh, well, you, well, you allowed me to strike through that and now I'm responsible for it. So now I'm coming to sue you. That's how quickly that can turn on you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can redline on an addendum. So let's say, for example, um, like, hey, buyer and seller agreed to get a licensed roofer to, you know, replace roof and close out permits prior to whatever final walk. Whatever. You can redline through that on an addendum 100 percent, get all parties to initial or any blank lines like on the purchase price. Like, you know, the per we came in at an offer at you know, 400,000, but the sellers want to cross through that 400,000 and put 410, get everybody to initial. Yes, you can do that. The inspection days, the number for the inspection days is 10 days. They are like, hey, we don't want 10 days. We're going to redline through that and do seven days, whatever the hell the case is. Those are the things that you should be able to redline through. The actual contract, if you were to pull it up and it says, what you know, whatever the hell is, do, and it's like black and white, don't yeah. cross through anything on there. No, don't do it. You are biting your, you are opening up the, the biggest can of worms because you are acting as an attorney. Don't do it. Don't do it. Okay. Thank you, Lori. I love what Lori, she said, ne exactly. Never change the contract or you will be, um, you will be liable. We are not attorneys. Correct. This is the reason why these contracts are done by the state, Correct. by attorneys. Yep. by yep. the Florida Association or every association that's based in every state when it comes to real estate. They've gone through this, fought for it, and determined those wordings and the linings in there. Yeah, It's not yep. for, oh, my buyer feels this way. And yeah, yeah, let's do that. It's easy. No, you're, mm -hmm. I would never accept anything. Did they accept the offer? No, not yet. It's still, they're, they're not still going to accept the offer. There's still I would say through... Yeah. But like email them saying fire has retracted offer, whatever the hell the case is. And if you want to go through and resubmit it, you know, submit it as is. But before you do anything, go talk to the broker before you go under contract on that one. Okay. Don't do that. All right. I'll talk you. Let me run this by you real quick for what her situation is. Would it be appropriate for her to put in the additional comments? Buyer is unwilling to pay prorated amount for oil and gas as per line, such and such of the contract. Or do you just kind of leave that alone? You leave um, that alone. What what oil and gas? Are you talking about the gas they're using for uh, heat? Is that what it is? I'm guessing so since she's up north. Yeah, but they don't own the property <laughs> till the closing date. Why would they pay for anything that's existing? That's a total bill. That's a bill for uh, your tire company who's going to call the utilities and the gas company will be one of them. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. No, no, this is, um, so we're in a rural area. So we actually have oil tanks that gets filled by other contractors, not like a gas company, like, like a, uh, how would I say this? It's like you get, you know, you get, you call PEP up and they come and fill your tank up and then you use the gas and each time that you, once it's done, you got to call them back for them to come refill it. Mm -hmm. So the lender is not calling the gas company for you or utilities or anything like that. So, um, so what's the concern about the know. prorating part? Huh? So why, why are they concerned about the proration then? And they should be happy there's gas in there that's going to be free. They can be using that's for a whole month. That's what I said, but she's like, I don't want to pay for that. I just want them to give it to me. And no, I was just like, it doesn't work yeah, that way. No. Okay. It doesn't work that you're way. Not doing good. I think you're not, maybe it's something that you've never done this before. Now, at least after this conversation, you know how to tackle that word. You know, if uh, yeah. you, you don't have to agree to everything and not uh, with your buyer or the seller. You got to exactly. stick your grounds for the rules. That's yeah. what's going to get you in trouble. Yeah. Trust me when I tell you that. Yeah. There are 100%. people out there, agents out there, they're looking for targeted agents such as this situation. I don't okay. know what kind of kick they get out of it. I don't get that way. I see contracts. I try to adjust them. I tell yeah. them, can you refix this, please? 
you know, hey, there's not enough time. Are you sure your lender can do it? I spoke to your lender. He said he needs 45 days. Why the hell did you put 30 days? And they're like, oh, I didn't talk to them. I did the job for you. Exactly. Uh, I think contract. Tina. Pay for the class. Like, how do I, how do I convince her? Like, this is something you have to do. It's prorated. It has to be done. This is, you know. And, and I try to tell her, I was like, look, there's probably no guests in there anyway. She's like, but you don't know. And I was like, okay, well, if we get accepted, I'll go through the, I'll go to the house and I'll check the tank to see if there's anything in there. But it, there's, it's probably empty. And she's like, well, empty or not, That's I don't want to pay job. for the job. That's not your like, job to go through and to check the tank. No, 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 no. Like, so much. Don't put yourself, like, you're putting yourself in liability. You're, putting a, don't you're opening up a bag of really. Because she already issues. sounds like, I will tell you, she already sounds like, I'm, I'm sorry, guys, are we being recorded? Yeah, we're live right now. Like, she already kind of sounds like she has a couple of loose screws. That is the kind of, like, for me, when I hear things like that, I'm like, oh, no, I want to make sure I cross my T's, dot my I's, document everything. Every time you have a conversation with her, follow up with the freaking email so you have a paper trail. Like, per our conversation, you told me you wanted to do this, this, and this. I advise you not this, this, and this. Cover your ass because she will be the one that comes to try to get point her fingers at you for everything that goes wrong through that transaction. Cover your yeah. ass. Um, I mean, when Tina. somebody's breaking an issue like that small an yeah. Yeah. issue, every issue Fine. in that inspection report is going to be like somebody's having a heart surgery, pretty much. So good yeah. luck. Take Xanax, whatever you got to take uh, when you're dealing with these guys or let them go. Yeah. I go with my gut every time. I know it's easy for yeah. people to say, oh, you've been doing this for 17 years. You're going to make X amount of dollars this year. No, I let people go Yep. even if they're good people because yep. i already feel that they're going to drain me and i'm not going to be able to put that great energy somewhere else so uh, I yeah. tina really really quick i'm going to address tina's question and then i don't know if paola has a question um so tina she is not under contract so for me the first thing i would do as soon as like while i'm on this call or however like but you know have the conversation with the buyer just let them know hey we need to pull this contract because i just act as an attorney and i well you don't even have to say all that like we need to pull this because i don't feel comfortable whatever you need to do and pull that contract send an email saying hey buyer is pulling that contract because i, I Liz, personally wouldn't do they would not accept that contract i will but, be shocked yeah however just to cover your ass make sure you send an email that you're um that you're withdrawing that offer yeah okay 100 percent. that's the way that you i'm gonna um, i'm gonna call my after this i'll talk to the brokers i'll go to the broker room and talk to them let them know what i did and then rewrite the contract i mean i already have the pdf there so all i have to do is update it update and take that red line out because all i did was yeah. put the line in using my yeah. um no what's that thing called the 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 striker yeah yeah that thing so okay and I'll talk. Eddie, to uh, quick question: Is your market shifting yeah. in your area, or no? It's still pretty hot for you guys. Um, it's it's shifting slightly. We are seeing price cuts, so um, it shifted. Yeah, and then the house that we are putting a contract on, it's been on the market for eighty days now, so um, yeah. it's it's definitely shifting here, and there's okay. been price cuts, so. Yeah. I think that appraisal aspect of it, you should yank that out, delete that paragraph ever for now. Because that's not, you should not be using that at all. You're just going to create, you know, and especially if you're not explaining to the agent, uh, buyer properly, a person like Liz or me will take full advantage of it. Mm -hmm. uh, 110%. And, and not because like, I'm like, oh, if they can't, so I'm walking away with five, where you're going to walk away with five grand and we can still put it back on the market. Like that's, you know, those are the conversations that I'm having. And it's not that I want to take advantage of a newer agent. It's just, you need to know your craft and I will do everything that I can like to help the agent through and to get them to understand like, hey, you are past your inspection period. We talked about this. There's no reason that you are the agent and your daughter is communicating with me. For all that, I should have just represented both sides. Just to, yeah, just to give you an example, what I, example I was giving on my listing, that when they went up eighteen thousand dollars, at the end, a week before closing, the buyer was short of money. Guess who came up with that money? My seller, because I educated them before they're overpaying for the property. This could be an issue, and they were very happy to give them credit, a couple of thousand dollars, just to make the deal happen. 
Yeah. But the agent had no clue what she was doing. And that's what it is. Okay, Paola, I know you have been so patient. So forgive us. We're going off on a route. But that, that was cool. How are you? I'm good. Uh, How are you? Good, good. Thank you. This is a great call. Um, so I do have a question. Um, I'm on contract. Um, I actually, it's my listing and um, the buyer is a um, investor and they actually uh, hired me as their um, buyer agent. So you're so working both, both sides. sides. So no, but it, it seems a little, it seemed easier than actually what it is. And um, it, I made the mistake probably of uh, when doing the contract for um, the buyer, I didn't put um, a, you know, number of days for Paula, you're breaking up. Hear me? No. Eddie, can you, can you mute yeah. your phone, Eddie, please? Because it's uh, clicking back and forward in there. So, so they went with a hard money lender, okay? Mm -hmm. The the buyer. And uh, my mistake here on the contract was that I didn't put, you know, the number of days for, you know, to have commitment, financing commitment. So um, it's the standard, which is 30 days, right? Now, um, the 30 days is not until the 22nd, right? But, you know, last week of September. So last okay. week, um, I went back to them and I said, hey, you know, um, I, I went to the lender um, and I asked them, hey, do we have, you know, loan commitment? Can you please tell me the status and this and that? And so the actual buyer came to me, right? And he said, hey, you know, this is a hard money lender. This is not how we work. Um, I do have credit with them up to $3 million. And, um, and I am certain that we're going to close, you know, this and that. The uh, lender hasn't come back to me, but, you know, I do have their letter, right, of pre-approval for the whole amount. Um, and now uh, the, the, well, and, and actually right at that moment, the buyer mentioned, hey, you know, we have the possibility um, of actually um, getting another, um, I guess, lender, lender uh, which is a friend of them in they're trying to get the money or the funds for no interest, right? As opposed to going with the lender and paying whatever interest they're going to pay. So, um, so they told me, okay, well, I'll give you a call, you know, uh, this week, um, today, actually, um, and, and we'll confirm, you know, which one we're doing. So today he writes to me and he says, hey, you know, we need an extension because we haven't been able to get approval. Uh, I'm sorry, an appraisal. So um, I want to go back, right? I Well, first of all, being that it is a hard money lender, how different is it from a, you know, a regular, you know, conventional, I guess, first of all, right, um, on, on that side? Do I, do, do I, can I, you know, will I be able to get, hey, yes, you know, uh, they are approved, you know, um, with, you know, uh, f from the lender, you know, um, obviously here I messed up and I put, you know, 30 or I left it blank. And so I'm probably not going to receive anything until 30 days. Right. Is, is that what it is? Deep, I think you'll have better insight. Okay, let's make it simple. Uh, I'm a little slow. Liz can tell you that. Okay. So you put in a contract, you represent the buyer and the seller, you're a transaction right. broker. So in Florida, right. everyone's a transaction broker. You're in Florida. Right. You use as this contract, you left the financing part empty. So it's yes. 30 days, right? Yeah. Perfect. So how long have you been on the contract? It, let me tell you, hold on. It, you what? should know. You, you should, should know. know. Uh, it should be in your well, calendar. It, okay. Yeah, no. It, it's like three weeks, definitely. Perfect. Three weeks because, Inspection's yeah. done? Inspection was done. Perfect. We already so you negotiated. One more, one yes. More one more week to do. Yes. My first question week. to you is, uh -huh. when you when you initially started working with the buyer, did uh -huh. you speak to the lender? I I I did, but you know they gave me the pre-approval. Um, as soon as they gave me the 
the approval, the pre-approval. Okay. So what that conversation was, did you have? Well, I asked, you I'm know, I'm trying to hey, break it down for you, so make it easier so you don't make yeah. mistakes with the game. Right. So mm -hmm. I, I did ask, you know, how strong were they, you know, um, if they see any issues, um, and, and that's, a, that's about it, right? Perfect. So um, my conversation will be this. Hey, Liz, I got your... Uh, uh, Tiffany, uh, your client you're working with, uh, I've had, I've got her offer. Just wanted to talk to you. Did you get everything you needed from Tiffany? No, I'm still waiting on some pay stubs and some verification of employment. Perfect. I'll make sure that, you know, we plug along and make sure I remind them. Second, how much time do you really need to get a commitment letter or a closing? A rough so idea? I'm looking at about 35, possibly 45 days, but I think I can get it done sooner. Perfect. Are you talking about the commitment or are you talking about closing? Uh, closing, closing, I think about 45 day, uh, 45 day close. I think I could do the commitment within like, you know, 30, 35 days. So perfect. So if I, if uh, you think it's safe to say that if I give you 30, 35 days for commitment and, we, uh, uh, and 10 more extra days or 15 more extra days for closing, would that work for you? Yeah, that would work. Perfect. Really looking forward to it. I'm going to be contacting the uh, Tiffany and let her know that she's still waiting for some stuff to submit. So they're on top of it. Uh, you know, this is the win. We got to make sure we all on the same page. So we make this process smoother. If you have any difficulties on your end, that uh, you cannot get hold of Tiffany or she's not providing what you need in a, a decent amount of time, please contact me. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. 100%. Boom. That's okay. the conversations that you want to have, especially as a listing agent or even a buyer's agent. When you're, when you're representing these buyers, guys, you want to make sure that you're having in-depth conversation so as a listing agent i ask for i ask for updates three times a week monday wednesday friday and if i don't get them you know i'm like and at a certain time i'm like i want to know where we are and if not i touch base with if they don't reach out to me i touch base with them hey so I'm just and don't take it personally some people are hard at explaining things or communicating i get that all the time i'm doing a deal I'm representing the buyer. I've never worked with this uh, lender. They're part of Publix. Publix has their own funding. I had no idea. Mortgage. I, yeah, that's very the, cool. The agent, the lender never responds to me, never calls me. Now it's gone to the underwriting. Luckily, underwriting responds to me. Uh, the buyer thinks they, they're clear to close. They already signed everything. And I, I emailed the underwriting. She said, no, we're not. And I'm getting two different stories. So please... I know, it, uh, Paula, it's, it's very exciting when you represent both parties. Mm -hmm. This could jeopardize your whole deal, even your right. listing. Right, right. Because now you've lost, uh, lost uh, faith in your seller that you didn't do your due diligence. Right. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I missed mm -hmm. that commitment part, right? I mean, I missed to ask the No, the I think lender. it was more than commitment yeah. part. This, this right. is where I want you to misunderstand that. There's, mm -hmm. uh, I know. Oh no, the conversation wasn't in depth. Definitely, yeah. It's not in depth. Second, you haven't kept in touch with them for almost three weeks. Now you're finding out, and now your buyer's switching lenders. That means you haven't had even in depth conversation with your buyer. Right. And you can't okay. do that. Yeah, so that's especially before a hundred times. Because there's time. So pressure, that, right? it doesn't. So it doesn't matter if it is a conventional or hard money lender. I mean. No, not at all. Hard money no. lender is much easier. Right. And so why would they, well, I guess, you know, I just don't understand. He's just being I difficult. Figured, yeah. Okay. He's, so he's shopping around. He thinks he's going to get a better rate. That's what exactly what he's doing. So, uh, so, so what do I do? So what do I do at this point where he's asking for an extension for an appraisal? I mean, simple. it's uh -huh. not even appraisal. It's the commitment letter too. forget the appraisal. Uh-huh. Commitment. Uh, you you are running out of in seven days. He's going to be out of contract. So you, the smartest thing I would do, uh -huh. and you play the bluff card poker. And please correct me, uh, Liz. I would call him back and said, "Why do we need more time? Are you switching a lender again?" And he says, "Yes, I am." And ask him what happened with the other one. Oh, he's charging me too much interest rate. Tell him interest rates. It's only going to go up next week. We are about to get one more increase. It might be almost to one point, guys. So and you need to get locked into have. your rate I would now. Say, I'm not sure if the seller is going to give us this. We're going to be out of contract. And he'll get this money back because uh, it's before 30 days. Yeah. Okay. But the so, seller can be difficult. Don't forget. 
seller, you're representing the seller. So you, you're literally walking on eggshell. I know you don't want to hear this, but you are. No, no, I, I understand. Yeah. yeah. I want okay. you to be secure. I want you to do the right thing. And I want you to learn the right way. That's why we have these calls. Right. No, definitely. And I appreciate it. I mean, definitely this was a mistake. And, you know, I'm, you know, it's, it's tough to, to learn it this way. But, um, but I'm glad it's learning. Definitely. You, yeah. Lucky part, you know, look at the good side. I'm going to give you a good side. You still have seven days to cancel the contract. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You can tell your lender, the hard money lender, get you a denial letter. And denial that's letter, it. and you'll and, and your buyer it's, will get their escrow. He gets back. his uh, deposit yes. back. Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm, so, I'm just telling you that. I would, if you were you're on the other side, I would never tell you that. Yep. Okay. So at this point, don't even pursue the extension, right? I mean. But no, the conversation you, that you need to have right now yeah. is, hey, who is your lender? Who are we committing to? We need to get this up and running. Like, we don't, like, how can you order an appraisal if you don't know who you're going to work with, who you're going to get the yeah. funds from? Yeah. You need to find that out first, like, because you need you need to get commitment. So it's simple conversation. Yep. Liz is my buyer, right? Uh, Liz, Liz is my buyer. Hey, Liz, what happened? Oh, this guy was charging me too much interest, so I decided to switch it in the middle. So how, how do you know the other guy's going to be, uh, Eddie's going to be much cheaper? Well, because she told me that she could save me a half a percent. Uh, great. Has he run your credits already? Run your numbers? Run, give it, have you given no. him all the information? No, haven't done anything. I said, do, Liz, you should know by now in this more shifting market, that means nothing. You know, people advertise out there, Rocket Mortgage, XYZ Mortgage says, oh, you can get four and a half, four point nine percent but you have to qualify under their guidelines. So how do we know that? Yeah, and you really think in seven days we're going to be able to do this and get an appraisal? No. Simple. I bet you Liz will answer her own question. Yep. Saying, oh, yeah, you're right. No, that's not going to work for me. Yep. What do we do? Unless like you sat there and you were submitting documents to another lender like today. or anything like that. Like you submitted everything and all of that good stuff. Mm -hmm. There is no, re you know, and that's why beforehand, yeah. before I even go through the pre, before I even put people under contract, I want to know who they're like, we're not doing this shopping around stuff. Right. Because when I'm sending my initial, when I'm sending my initial emails, I'm sending it out to the title company, to the lender you know, putting all the documents on there, the listing agent, so that we have one email thread and everyone has their, and I put everyone's contact information. This is the lender. This is this person. This is that person. I want my people to know we're crystal cut clear. We don't have, there's no questions about it before we go under contract, who you are working with. You've right. already, like, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll spend, you know, two weeks letting my buyer shop around for the lender that they connect well with who they can who they um, is responsive and responding to me as their agent that's the way oh pancakes sorry my husband just has me he's making pancakes well if yeah. i were you i would talk to them first have this deep conversation he said i'm not sure we can get an extension i can check with the seller and the seller is going to ask you these hard questions what's going on yep. you can't lie Remember that you're in transaction based. Right. So what are you going to yeah. do that? In that case, you're better off canceling the contract beforehand, releasing right. the money and getting a new buyer in there who's much serious, who's not playing around and, oh, right. I'm going to save a quarter well, percent. And I, I, I don't believe the actual, you know, um, change of lenders has happened. I think he was, you know, not even, well, I don't know if shopping, but he was trying to get a friend, you know, to, to actually go on board on, on this purchase. So they wouldn't have to pay interest rate. That that's my understanding. Now, hopefully, you know, it, it, it is that, and they haven't changed mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and it's just a matter of getting the appointment of the appraiser. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and we can continue as, you know, as, as it was, um, and still, maybe, you yeah, but it's still very, today. yes, yes, definitely. Okay. Even in this market, it's going to be very difficult to get somebody out there in seven days. I'm just, don't take that risk. Do not gamble on yourself in this market. It's not okay. controlled by you. You're working with a third party lender. First of all, lenders are, you know what it is? They're numbers game. He's got a deal from Liz, He's got a deal from Tiffany. He's got a deal, a deal from Tina. He got a deal right. from me. He's just putting in the pile. Oh, it's gone to the next level. I don't have to worry about it. Let me work on the new deal. <clears throat> yep. And they forget. Yeah, yeah. Don't risk, don't put yourself in liability where that buyer is can lose their escrow and Plus they will come back. 
and you're going to lose that listen. You can lose the, both clients at once. Make sure you're crossing your T's and tell them like, you need to make a decision now. You need to make a decision now. We're seven days away. I don't want to risk your escrow. So if you're going to move forward, how are we moving forward? And let's go from there because this needs to get nipped in the butt now. So if we're moving mm -hmm. forward, um, I, I need an addendum or, or right? Or an extension addendum, right? Uh, because definitely, you know, they're, they're deciding. Uh -huh. You're going to need an addendum, not only to extend closing, mm -hmm. but you're going to have to extend loan commitment as well. Yep. You have to extend both dates. Okay. Speaking and of you'll find out how long. long you, it's not what you need. It's what you're going to find out from the buyer. Buyer's going to tell you whatever it is. You got to tell your buyer to save your money right now. I need you to go back to your uh, lender, the lender who you don't want to work with, give you a denial letter, because now I can hold you for it. Yep. How many, is there a limit on the amount of extensions that, you know, and any one party can do? Or is, is it going it to be based on, on both It's just parties. agreed upon. It's just it really agreed upon the buyer and seller. Okay. It, yeah, it really depends on both parties. If the listing agent really want to work with you. They will extend it. As many extend, extensions needed to make the deal work then? Yeah. No. Uh, no? Wait. It depends. Depends. Like if, they're, if they think that they have more people looking at the offer or and uh, things are changing, they might say, I don't want to deal risk this buyer anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's going to be based It has on to be agreed team. upon both, yeah, both parties. parties. So okay. both parties have to agree upon it. However, Always if they're willing to do your, 30... 30 extensions because both parties agreed to do 30 extensions then right. so be it however if the seller is like absolutely not i'm not doing this again yeah. then that's just what it is okay. and you need 30. to let the buyer know and yes. when you get that feedback from the listing agent this mm -hmm. is the last extension to yes. cover your end you let yeah. the buyer know this is it yeah, yeah. yeah. That happens. Happens. it's that a bigger deal right commercial now. deals happens i did a deal last month uh we were under contract for uh 18 months I had nine extensions. But this the, the, is this the big trend that the, the townhouses community? No, this is something, yeah, different one. Yeah. Eddie, you've had a, that transaction out there for a while. What did the broker tell you? You've you've been, I'm gonna say it out loud, screwing around with this thing for eight weeks. Exactly. You should have already closed. Yep. Where is that one at? Talk that tell that to my buyer who's um not it, it, no. It has no, nothing it's to you, do with Eddie. your buyer. You keep on blaming people. Stop. You represent you the buyer. You represent. It's your license on the line. Nobody else's. You guys, that's my question regarding Paula's situation where she's representing both. Is the seller, isn't that the one with the listing agreement that holds more weight? Is that no, true? she's a transactional broker in the state Everybody's of Florida. Everybody's a transaction in Florida. Yes. Transaction broker. Me. She represents the transaction. Correct. So I didn't... only the transaction. Robert, so... hold on, hold on. Just... <laughs> so my question. Hold on. My question is, the listing. It, I know you're. I understand transaction broker representing both is the transaction, the transaction, the transaction. But between us, a listing agreement isn't that spreading more about your credibility if you're representing the seller that your sign is in their yard and. Couldn't you be saying to that buyer, you know what, dude, <laughs> we're taking too long. There are people interested. You need to really decide if you want this home, period. Or do you have to honor them wanting the extension? No, you don't so, have to honor anything. You, you go back to your seller, ask them if they'll provide them the extension. If you get the right answers from the buyer, then only you do that. If the buyer is still being fishy and right. say, oh, I'm going to think about it, Tina. I'm not sure if I'm going to go with Rocket Mortgage or XYZ or I don't know yet. Right there, your job is to tell him, go get me a denial letter. I'm going to release your escrow. Mm -hmm. You're going to put the property in the market. When you're serious remember, about it, put it back. Remember, guys, like, the remember, we get, we, okay, so you have, Tina, what I'm, what I'm going to tell you right now, you have to take your emotion out of it, right? Because yeah. as you have to take the, we are, our duty is to the transaction. Yes, if we represent the seller, we're gonna wanna get everything that we can for our sellers because we are passionate and we are emotional beings and it's an emotional transaction. However, we are not 
this is not emotional. This is about the transaction. So you have to do your due diligence to both parties in order to make sure that it goes through smoothly. Like take the emotion out of it. Like, yes, oh my God, I'm so happy I got this listing. It's my mom and I want to make sure I take care of her. But if you're representing that buyer, you have to make sure that you are doing your service to the transaction. It completely negates everything else. Tina, think about it this way. <clears throat> The sign out front, and you said there's a sign out front. The listing is owned by EXP Realty. It's owned by our broker, okay? If we have the seller side or the buyer side, we work for their best interest for mm -hmm. their side of the transaction. Unless you've got a single agency agreement, it's always transaction. Right. And I hate to say it's cold, that we take all the emotional away, but this is a business transaction. You have to think about it from that standpoint. I'm not saying that we don't make friends along the way and we don't have passion for what people are doing for buyers and sellers. But at the end of the day, our reputation is to the transaction. Correct. And when we do the right thing, our reputation follows us into our personal side. Yes. Yeah. I hear what you're saying. I think I am thinking too hard about it being my business and my name's on that sign with the XP. And I just feel like, am I going to lose my listing and a buyer or am I going to, I mean, that's, yeah, I don't know about, I'm thinking business. I'm thinking about reputation and whatever, but I just, you know, I don't know. Okay. Guys, Thanks. guys, you're taking, uh, we're going to keep on repeating. You keep on yeah. saying my reputation. You're getting your emotional involved in that. It's your reputation. It's your ego. It's your, oh, I'm going to lose this listing. Or I'm going to lose. No, that's you. You as a, as your duty, as a professional real estate or, uh, agent in Florida, when you get your license to DBPR, that means you haven't yet done your job right. Because if you put emotions in this, you're pretty much, you're, you should not be uh, handling this licensing at all because you're supposed to be an expert doing the right thing when it comes to the right deal, not put your emotion. Oh my God, is my face on the uh, sign in the front? I'm going to lose that. And the broker. Yeah. If the buyer, buyer gets upset, the seller gets upset, they can both come after you. Forget the broker. It's going to come after you, not the broker. Broker has the ENO insurance. It's going to be protected. We have a $5 million uh, limit on each transaction. Uh, but you know, your job is to represent both party the best to your knowledge, not with yeah. your with emotion, emotion passion. Yeah, I get we all have passion. I have passion for real estate, and you can't even describe it. Like I I mm -hmm. wake up, sleep, shit, eat real <laughs> estate. That's all I do. But doesn't mean that I bring my emotions in the deal. To the transaction. Yeah. So I guess I'm going to have trouble with the whole discernment thing because I'm thinking that the buyer's just dragging their feet and yanking our, you know, that's all. I I guess I have to, I don't know. So that's where you, you have to be rational simple. about it. You have that, to be rational what, yeah. about it and say, yeah. hey, this is like, so take, take your emotions out of it. This is what needs to be done. If this isn't done, this is what you are prepared to lose. These are the facts. Yeah. These, these are the facts. This is what needs to be done. If you, if you do not get loan commitment by this date, you will not get you, you will. And it's this day and we go past five o'clock on this day. Again, I like to use the word five o'clock because you know, that's what we're told, but however, inspection, we're, that's a whole other thing. Bye deep. We love you. However, thank you. Okay. I'll see you soon. I think we need we, a longer conversation on yes. these two topics. Yes. And I think we're going to dummy down like the yep. four, like the uh, conversation me and Liz were having. And and really like, you know, you guys need to make your, your questions and your answers much simpler in your head so you don't complicate your emotions in this deal. It's and there's very... times where I call deep for advice and he's like, let's take the emotion out of it. And I'm like, you know what? It you happened, right. uh, he happened not even two months ago. Two months ago. She yep. agreed on something in her head. She vouched for something that she's going to get this for the seller. I said, what are you doing? And she said, what? I said, take yourself out of the deal. She's like, holy fuck. 
I'm You're sure right. it happens. I'm sure it happens all the time, it guys. To it, all it's, of us. Not, it's not saying that we're perfect, you know, yeah. because we do get passionate, we do get emotional, we get emotionally attached. By people, we get emotionally Thanks, attached Steve. to our Thank transactions. You. However, when we have to go through, like when we're talking about timelines, guys, we have to take the emotion out of it. It's hey, this is what it is, black and white. This is what it is. This is what it isn't. If you are not going to do this and get title and get loan commitment by this day, you are going to lose your escrow. Are you prepared to do that? Yes or no? No. Okay, so one of two things are going to happen. Get me a denial letter because you're, we're going to cancel the contract or you're going to stick with the lender that you have and I can request a loan, um, a, an extension for this for the appraisal, whatever the case is, not only to extend closing, but to extend loan commitment as well for an additional seven, whatever, how many days you need to do. That's what it is. Factual, black and white. There's no ands, ifs, or buts. There's no questions about it. Because when you're like, oh, well, I think you're kind of dragging your feet. Yes, you are 100. You need to make a decision now because these are the repercussions if you do not. That's it. And it's Tina, hard to do that sometimes. Tina, think about it this way. Someone over the age of 18 has entered into a legal and binding contract that has repercussions to the actions and the terms and conditions are clearly laid out inside of that contract on everything that they need to do. Our job is to make sure that they stay within the rails and they follow the process and we remind them of any upcoming events that have repercussions in the contract. If they need something changed, we are giving every form possible so that both parties can agree to, to changes of terms and conditions. It's not you, it's not me, it's not Liz, it's the parties to the contract. We are not a party to the contract. We are there to guide them through the process. If they make a mistake and they wanna come and yell at us, if they wanna spew us all over social media, so be it. We know what the truth of the matter is. Yep. I People say that I am absolutely cold in this. And you have no idea how much passion I have. But I don't take it into the business transaction. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. I, I know it sounds cold. No, but it's not the at only all. way you can do it. Not yeah. at all. It doesn't sound cold at all, actually. I, I'm afraid I've come off as being emotional, and maybe there is some of that, but the truth is I would be whole, cold, hard backs to that buyer because I feel like, and there's the feel. <laughs> it, it's yeah. obvious that they're dragging their feet and trying to hold up, but I guess, like you said, black and white. There are papers that will allow them to do that as long as they want to. And as long well, as that's what I was talking about in the beginning, Tina, when exactly. I told you about my condo that I have under contract, I'm representing the seller. The mother, the mother is yes, a licensed exactly. broker. Listen, like, you know, the mother is a licensed broker. So the fact that you have your daughter who is not a licensed agent texting me about a repair two days after the end of the inspection period, of course, I'm ignoring it because First and foremost, it's past our inspection period. Second, you did not ask, you did not send me a request on a, on a, on an addendum, on an addendum that pertains to the contract. Third, it is you didn't request an extension to extend the um, the inspection period. So when I hit you with, hey, you did th these are the cold hard facts. Hey, you did not like. I'm sorry, like your daughter should not be communicating with me. You are her realtor. I should not be in communication with your daughter. I understand that you just got married and you're overseas. I would have gladly represented both sides if you could not be here to do your due diligence to your client because take the emotion out of it. If it was your, if, what if it was a freaking $6 million client? Would yeah. you be treating it the same way? You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you had the audacity to, to request a repair from me and you're texting it to me. So if I, so at that point, like if they were to want to cancel the contract and they would want to fight for that five grand, I could just, I'll go and I'm like, I have no, I'm like, Hey, here are the facts of the situation. And, and the inspection was at 3 PM. The end of the inspection period ended on Thursday. I've received a text message from the daughter, not from the licensed professional stating that they wanted this item fixed on Saturday. Wow. The end of the inspection period was on Thursday. 
They did not they did not send it on an addendum. They did not submit release and cancellation with the addendum, or nor did they ask for an extension. So if you were to sit there and tell me th that you think that your client is getting that your buyer is getting their five grand back for their escrow, you are dead wrong. And I will fight for every single penny. I'm not gonna get. They're not gonna. They're. I'm, I'm going to. So I. I have the facts of the transaction where you can't question it because I'll, I'll. All I gotta do is tell the broker, hey, this is this and this. They don't need the emotion of it. Yep, this wasn't done. This was done. You're fine. Good to go. We keep the five grand. If they want to go, if they want to fight for it, we could go through arbitration. You could do what you want, and my clients are gonna win. Yeah. And then they're gonna get additional damages. Are you prepared to do that? Because you didn't do your job. Nope. Okay, then. Perfect. So that that's what it is. And that's what we're trying to get you guys to understand. Yeah. Like, yes, we are emotional. However, when you are laying out the facts and the repercussions of what you are doing, you are going to be just fine. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much. I'm going to let y'all go because you've been <laughs> on here so long and I, I really do appreciate it. I know everyone does. So y'all have a great day. You have a blessed day, Thanks, Tina. Tina. I, we definitely need to break this up into like yeah, <laughs> two or th like three or four sessions. I feel like I get very passionate, especially when it comes to this, because I've had, you know, we've all come across issues and everything, guys, and it's okay. We just, we have to learn from it. And I never want anybody to be put in a situation to, hey, you're just as quickly as you get this commission check, it's going right out the door because you have to pay for this plus, plus more. So you're in the negative. Liz, you realize this is one of my most passionate areas of real estate. Oh, I know this is. When I have like real deep, like serious things. Oh my God. Remember Robert, when the lady told me, when the agent told me that her husband wasn't going to signing because she didn't know on the contract that we put 3% concessions mm -hmm. and told me two days before closing that her husband wasn't going to sign because they are the sellers. And I just completely ignored it. And they end up going to closing because you are a licensed professional. You didn't read the additional terms that says seller to contribute 3% to a buyer's closing costs and prepays. That's your fault, not mine. It's in the contract. You sign the contract. That's it's the terms and conditions that you're, that you're, that you're held to. <laughs> Absolutely. Happens all the time, guys. Know your stuff, know your dates, and you will be fine. If you have questions, ask someone else. Ask Just your broker. <laughs> Go.